Okay. Good morning and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Cultural Affairs, jointly with the Committee on Economic Development. At this time, would all council members and council staff please turn on their videos. To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices on vibrate or silent mode. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that's testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. Chairs, we are ready to begin. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you, Sergeant at Arms and everyone for making it today. Let's begin this hearing. So good morning and welcome to this joint hearing between the New York City Council's Committee on Economic Development and Cultural Affairs, Libraries and International Intergroup Relations. Today is Thursday, September 24th, 2020, and my name is Paul Ballone, and I have the privilege of chairing the Committee on Economic Development, as well as with my co-chair and friend, Council Member J James Van Bramer, our esteemed chair of Cultural Affairs. I'd like to extend my seat of thanks to members of both committees, the administration and the city's official tourism marketing organization, New York City and Company, for coming together to hold this important and critical hearing. These are extraordinary times for our city, the prolonged fallout from the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic continues to leave its mark on every sector of the city's economy, but nowhere is it more pronounced than our tourism, arts, entertainment, and hospitality sectors. Tourist numbers have plummeted since Governor Cuomo declared a state of emergency back on March 7th, and has been little recovery in the long months since. Hotel occupancy rates fell to just about 15% in late March, and as of early this month, this those rates improved to just 38%. Today, we will hear that the rate has dropped even to eight to 10%, excluding the whole hotels used as shelters, with almost 40% of holes, hotels not even reporting. This is a far cry from the city's typical bustling hotels where over 93% of our rooms are occupied on average. The financial loss for the city and our employees that depend on the industry is simply staggering and has never been seen before. The pandemic has shuttered most of the city's world-class arts and entertainment attractions, our remaining restaurants have been surviving on take, takeout or outdoor dining as long as the weather permits, or until another set of permits hinders even this small salvation. Even obtaining permission for outdoor heating lamps has become the latest example of the lack of interagency coordination on these matters. Even the governor's decision to start indoor reduced dining at 25% falls short of what is needed for our restaurants and the jobs they provide for us to survive. Overall, the impact to our city's tourism sector has resulted in the loss of over 200,000 jobs since March. New York City and Company, the city's official tourism and marketing agency, has not seen an increase in their budget for over eight years and relies heavily on private funding to complete their critical mission. We have rep repeatedly asked for increases to this budget and to give the CEO and president of this company, Fred Dixon and his great team, the critical resources they need. But this has gone to no avail. Now their team has suffered a $12 million loss of its private funding and a $1 million loss of its city funding. All of its remaining reduced staff continue to suffer, suffer salary reductions while this enormous task remains. This past May, to tackle the pandemic, New York City and Company co-founded the Coalition for New York City Hospitality and Tourism Recovery to support the city's recovery efforts. And the heads of roughly 700 tourist attractions were represented in this leadership. The coalition's roadmap to tourism recovery, titled All In New York City, is designed to act as guidelines for the arts, entertainment, hospitality, and restaurant sectors who can follow to bring tourists back to the city and help get our economy back to work. It looks like the coalition is orienting into the third stage of its rise, renew, and recover revitalization campaign. And we look forward to hearing details on the success of that campaign in today's testimony. As chair of the Economic Development it has been and remains a privilege to work with all of the partners in this virtual room today and to champion what makes the city the greatest of all. New York and Company just last year had record numbers with media campaigns that brought over 66 million tourists to our city. However, in just six months, we have been crippled by a never ending pandemic that has brought these uncertain times to every sector of our city and beyond. This is why we have repeatedly asked for a guaranteed funding stream and dedicated resources and staff from the administration working with this city council to support the critical work New York and Company does for our city. It is difficult to envision how this can happen unless the administration commits to bring additional resources to support New York and Company. 
every other major city throughout the world that depends on tourism is facing the same challenge. To survive, we will need to meet that challenge and to commit to bringing even new, new, new resources, not hide behind the financial crisis. This brings us to the sector today of our tourism and hospitality industry and the experience and knowledge that they bring from working with decades of different administrations and what we must address right now to do what is to needed to be done to this vital industry. That is why I sponsored proposed introduction 1773A, which would immediately establish an emergency temporary office of tourism recovery directly within the office of the mayor. The goal of this office would be to facilitate the city's tourism recovery efforts by coordinating across city agencies, city hall, and the public on all issues relating to city tourism recovery, assisting local businesses with their tourism recovery efforts, cutting through the bureaucracy of multiple agencies that are already overwhelmed, acting to immediately and continuously interact with every sector of the tourism and hospitality partners of our city, and keeping the administration and this council up to date on those efforts through quarterly reports to the mayor and the speaker. Notably, this office would cease to exist after five years. My goal with this legislation is to provide an additional and a critical resource within the administration to di directly work with New York City and Company and the coalition of partners that are represented here today and to kickstart kick and support the tourism recovery through the city. We must do more and how we proceed from now will define the future of city's tourism and the hospitality industry. We will also be hearing three other pieces of legislation today, uh, a bill and a resolution sponsored by my co-chair, Jimmy Van Bremer, which he will discuss following these comments, and one sponsored by our majority leader, Lori Cumbo, which I believe she's here to discuss as well. We hope this hearing will provide both committees with an opportunity to hear the administration's plans to address the city's tourism recovery efforts and to hear from the many advocates in the tourism and cultural affairs sectors on their experiences and struggles operating against the backdrop of our global pandemic. Before I turn the floor over to, our, to my co-chair, I would like to acknowledge the hard work done by my committee staff in preparation for this hearing. Special thank you to Legislative Council Alex Polanoff, Policy Analyst Emily Forgione, Finance Analyst Aliyah Ali, my Chief of Staff Jonathan Shutt, and my Legislative Director Ahmed Nazar for all their hard work in putting this hearing together. I would like to now turn the floor over to my friend and dear co-chair, Councilmember Jimmy Van Ray. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Vallone, uh, for your leadership and for uh, your understanding that the tourism and really the health and vitality of the city of New York is in large part driven by culture, the arts, artists, and the creative class. And that's why all of the pieces of legislation that we're hearing today are of course connected uh, in every way. So. I want to thank you for uh, your proposed piece of legislation, which is incredibly important. And of course, we'll talk a little bit about those stemming directly from our committee. Uh, my name is Jimmy Van Bramer, and I'm very proud to be the chair of the Committee on Cultural Affairs, Libraries, and International Intergroup Relations, the committee with the longest name in the history of the City Council. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, and his. And as my colleague, Councilmember Vallone noted, there are three pieces of legislation that both myself and Majority Leader Cumbo have introduced that we'll be hearing today as well. Uh, the first, intro number 2068, uh, sponsored my, by myself and about 14 other colleagues of mine, is meant to establish an open, a culture program akin to the open restaurants and open streets programs that we've seen implemented so successfully uh, in our city. Uh, the city has done a great job in uh, responding and creating those open streets and open restaurants programs and moving quickly. We haven't moved as quickly when it comes to responding to the absolute desperation of so many of our performing arts organizations and theater groups, dance companies, and we are seeing the effects of that. So many cultural organizations, both large and small, are literally struggling to survive. And if we don't do something drastic to give them the opportunity to perform 
and to bring in revenue, uh, many in our cultural community will cease to exist. Uh, and that is the dire state that we're in. The Met Opera cancellation of the 2021 season got a lot of attention and rightfully so. It's an incredibly important institution uh, as someone who loves opera myself. But the truth is there are so many much smaller organizations, much smaller performance uh, and other cultural organizations that have not been able to open their doors, perform, rehearse, or gain any revenue since the second week of March. Intro 2068, uh, which we initially proposed in uh, late May, has taken too long to be heard, but uh, I am anxious to push the administration forward to doing something that could have a transformational effect on the cultural community. And when you help and you sustain the cultural community in the city of New York, you help and you sustain the tourism industry and you actually sustain our people uh, because in these times, people need to laugh and dance, hear music, sing and feel joy more than ever. And no one does that better for the city of New York than artists and the cultural community. Uh, I also want to say that as far as the intro at 2060 is concerned, uh, we fully realize that the bill needs to be uh, amended. And I absolutely support extending the uh, March 31st, 2021 deadline that's in the bill right now. And absolutely, we need to make sure that cultural organizations can charge for outdoor performances uh, because they need to survive. They need to pay the artists who are actually uh, doing the work. So uh, I'm excited about this particular piece of legislation because it is uh, forcing a question that the city absolutely has to answer, which is uh, how hard will we work to save the arts, save culture and uh, save artists and now is the time. We cannot wait any longer. We all wish that COVID would be gone as soon as possible and that people would be able to fill theaters on Broadway and take in an opera at the Met or sit in a terrific black box theater and see an amazing dance performance. But the truth is that it's probably going to be very hard to imagine uh, anytime soon. So while we are entering into a cold weather period, this legislation is as relevant as ever because come the spring and summer, we're still going to need uh, this piece of legislation uh, absolutely desperately if cultural organizations are going to succeed. Uh, I wanna thank Commissioner Gonzalo Casals, who was with us today, uh, the Commissioner of the Department of Cultural Affairs, uh, uh, fellow uh, Queens uh, uh, member of our community in so many ways. Uh, and thank him for being here and for his efforts. And I know how deeply he feels about this issue and the community that we both represent. Um, and of course, the connection. While the arts first and foremost sustains us and thrives us as human beings, it is also an economic driver for the city of New York. And um, it is one of the largest industries in New York City, employing uh, at least 400,000 uh, workers, uh, $31 billion in wages, generating at least $110 billion in economic activity. Last year, the theater industry alone uh, grossed nearly $2 billion. Uh, and drew nearly 15 million patrons, while the dance sector contributed over $300 million to the city's economy. Uh, to put that in context, the theater industry brought to our city revenue roughly equivalent to the GDP of Belize. And the cultural community has been gathering every day at three o'clock and I wanna thank them. And I wanna thank all of you 
uh, who have joined in support of this bill. I've also sponsored resolution 1422, uh, which is in support of the Save Our Stages uh, bill, both in the Senate and in the House of Representatives, establishing a grant program for small live venue operators and talent representatives to address the economic effects of COVID-19. I know there's some state uh, efforts to that effect as well. Uh, I also want to, uh, uh, and we'll be recognizing very soon, the majority leader recognized her bill, intro number 2034, which she'll speak about in much more detail, uh, creating an app to coordinate uh, the use of open space for art and cultural programming. And I wanna recognize the members of the Cultural Affairs Committee who have joined us, obviously Majority Leader Cumbo, Council Member Joni and Council Member Borelli. So uh, with that, I wanna thank my staff, uh, my legislative director, Jack Bernadovitz, my chief of staff, Matthew Wallace, uh, the committee's principal financial analyst, Alia Ali, uh, our policy analyst, Christy Dwyer, and our committee counsel, Brenda McKinney, for all of their work on these pieces of legislation. And uh, I look forward to hearing from the administration on all of these pieces of legislation. With that, I will hand it over to Majority Leader Cumbo to speak to intro number 2034. And if I could just announce that we've also been joined by council members Powers, Lewis, Ku, Luanda, and Menchaka, as well as the council members mentioned by council member Jimmy Van Ryan. Majority Leader, it's all yours. We have Lori. Hello, can you hear me? Yay, Ed Mama Lori. <laughs> Yeah. Good morning. I want to thank both of our chairs, Valone, and I also want to thank uh, Chair Jimmy Van Bramer uh, for your efforts and support today. I just want to start um, unrelated to this, but very related. As a Black woman here in New York City and in America, just feeling mm -hmm. a deeper sense of vulnerability, hearing the verdicts and situations and the lack of indict indictments in the Breonna Taylor case. Um, it's a tough morning for me, and I imagine it's a tough morning for Black women across this country um, and across this nation, and it's probably equally an even greater challenge for Black men across this country who are given the task of protecting us, which seems it is an impossibility at this time. And so, as I say, it's unrelated. It's so related because it impacts every single thing about our being, our ability to work, our ability to show up, and our ability to get things done. So as this meeting is happening today, I'm, I'm hoping in many ways that the arts community can continue to utilize their voice and their creativity to bring about the voice of change and justice that we need to see um, in this country. So I thank you all and I will uh, continue with my opening statement today, but just knowing that my heart is heavy and my voice is weak today. I wanna start by thanking Brenda McKinney, our talented committee counsel who has handled the weight of her position and responsibilities as a mother with seemingly effortless grace. You are an everlasting inspiration to working mothers like myself. And when we think about the ramifications of this global pandemic, we must always consider our cultural organizations. New York City's cultural sector is one of the largest industries in the world, and it is the backbone of New York City's economy employing over 400,000 workers, paying over $30 billion in wages per year, and generating more than $110 billion in economic activity. If just focused on the levels of economics, we recognize that the arts are what's driving New York City. It's why people come here. It's why people are in hotels, why they are in our cabs, why they are all here eating and dining in our restaurants. Without that level of activity, New York cannot succeed. From the start of the pandemic, my team has been so proud of the DCLA's daily cultural calls at three. 
which at its peak brought well over 300 of our city's cultural institutions and local not-for-profits together. This level of unity and strength has been an inspiration to so many. These calls have gained a strong understanding of the challenges that our cultural organizations have and continue to face in light of the global pandemic. We've repeatedly heard one of the several difficulties for these organizations, especially right now, is space. It's critical that we have space so that our voices, our creativity, and our talents can be heard. As a result of COVID-19, our city has made significant innovations to make more efficient use of our public spaces. We have brought outdoor dining onto our sidewalks, enjoyed free healing movement and dance classes in Fort Green Park, and so many more. Intro 2034 would create a website that would allow organizations to identify and apply for public spaces to feature their programming. Furthermore, a mobile application would be developed to streamline this process, allowing any New Yorker to find cultural programming near them. And that's so critical right now because as Chair Van Bramer has said, we need to be together, socially distanced, but we need to see one another. It is clear now more than ever that it is possible to utilize public spaces for cultural programming. It is also clear that if we do not utilize these spaces, it is unlikely that more than half of these institutions will be around to have another opportunity next year. And I, I just wanna close by saying, it's so critical that we have these spaces because these spaces are going to be what's going to heal. It's going to be what's gonna bring about the voices of change. We need those centers where ideas can be exchanged, where people can learn about one another, that they can hear one another's ideas. And so I hope that we can work with the administration to realize this. This isn't the type of idea that's a dream app or a dream mm -hmm. website. This is something that's critical for sustainability and survival for our institutions at this time. I'll turn it back over to our chairs and thank you so much to Chair Vallone and Chair v Jimmy Van Bramer. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Majority Leader. And um, as our, our chairs and council members have said, this is going to be a, a uh, very important hearing. And if those who are joining us virtually for the first time before the Sergeant at Arms swears in and we start the testimony from the agencies and the commissioners, just to kind of give you a quick overview, you're going to hear um, the testimony now from the different agencies that are involved in the tourism sector. Then you're going to hear both from the co-chairs, myself and Jimmy Van Bramer and some of the council members, some follow-up questions. Then you'll see the panels start coming. Um, so you'll see uh, five minutes of testimony from the council members and then two minutes for all the panelists because at this point we're over 30 different uh, organizations and panels are growing. So that's just a little summary and Sergeant Arms, if you can swear in our panel. Actually, Chair, uh, I'm going to take over and just go over some procedural items first sure. before we have the sergeants thanks, swear sir. anybody in. Uh, thanks. Thank you, Chairs Vallone, Van Bramer, and Majority Leader Tumbo. Uh, I'm Alex Polinoff, counsel to the Economic Development Committee of the New York City Council. Before we begin testimony, uh, I'd like to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you were called upon to testify at which point you will be unmuted by the host. Members of the administration who are testifying will not be muted during their question and answer portions of their testimony. Uh, and I will be calling upon the panelists individually to testify. Please listen for your name to be called. The first panelist to give testimony will be the president and CEO of New York City and Company, Fred Dixon, as well as New York City and Company's chief marketing officer, Nancy Mamana. From the Department of Cultural Affairs, Commissioner Gonzalo Casals will be providing testimony. Deputy Commissioner Sheila Feinberg and Director of External Affairs Ryan Max will also be available for questioning. From the Mayor's Office of Citywide Event Coordination and Management, Executive Director Ellen Canfield will be providing testimony. And Director of the Street Activity Permitting Office Stefan Grabowskis will be available for questioning. Uh, three other agencies will also have representatives available solely for questioning. From the Economic Development Corporation, Senior Vice President of Marketing, Alex Costas. From the Department of Transportation, Assistant Commissioners, Wendy Fuhr and Sean Quinn, as well as Assistant Director, Andrew Ronan. From the Department of Parks and Recreation, Director of Citywide Special Events, Anthony Sama. 
Director of Government Relations, Matt Drury, and Deputy Director of Government Relations, Bruce Thomas. And from the Department of Information Technology and Telecommunications, Assistant Commissioner Robin Levine. I will call on you shortly for the oath, and then again when it is time to begin your testimony. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question of the administration or of the specific panelist, please use the Zoom raise hand function, and I will call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes, which includes the time it takes to answer questions. Please note that for ease of this virtual hearing, we will be not allowing, we will not be allowing a second round of questions for each panelist outside of the committee chairs. All hearing participants should submit written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov if you have not already done so. The deadline for written testimony is 72 hours after the hearing. The committee chairs have also asked me to note for the public that we have a large number of witnesses scheduled to testify today. We expect this to be a long hearing, but we will be reviewing written testimony, which is also part of the record, in case you need to leave before you are called upon to testify. Before we begin testimony, I will administer the oath. To all members of the administration who will be offering testimony or will be available for questions, please raise your right hands. I will read the oath and then call on each of you individually for a response. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before these committees today and to respond honestly to council member questions? President Dixon? I do. Chief Marketing Officer Mamana? I do. Commissioner Casals? I do. Deputy Director Feinberg? I do. Director Max? I do. Executive Director Canfield. I do. Director Grabowskis. I do. Senior Vice President Costas. I do. Assistant Commissioner Fewer. I do. Assistant Commissioner Quinn. I do. Assistant Director Ronan. I do. Director Sama. I do. Director Drury. I do. And I'll note that uh, Deputy Director Bruce Thomas was, was called away on an emergency, uh, on emergency, so you can sort of skip to the next one. But Director Sam and I are obviously available. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, Assistant Commissioner Levine. I do. Thank you all. Uh, President Dixon, if you are ready, you may begin your testimony. Thank you very much. Good morning, Chairman Vallone, Chairman Ben Bramer, and members of the Committees on Economic Development and Cultural Affairs, Libraries, and International Intergroup Relations. My name is Fred Dixon, and I'm the President and CEO of NYC and Company. I'm joined today by our Chief Marketing Officer, Nancy Mamana. We thank you for this opportunity to share the impact of COVID-19 on the city's tourism and hospitality industry. What NYC and Company has done to support the industry from the beginning of the pandemic and our efforts to resuscitate the industry as we work towards economic recovery. I would like to provide a quick background on who we are and what we do as an organization. NYC and Company is the official destination marketing and tourism organization for the five boroughs of New York City. We are also often known as the Convention and Visitors Bureau or CVB. Our mission is to maximize travel and tourism opportunities throughout the city, build economic prosperity and spread the dynamic image of the five boroughs around the world. We are a 501c6 private not-for-profit member organization and represent the interests of nearly 2,000 member businesses and organizations from across the five boroughs. We are governed by an 85-member board of directors, which represents a diverse range of businesses from across the city. Our members range from hotels, cultural organizations, restaurants and attractions, 
to bids and chambers of commerce. Together, they fund about half of our operations. We also hold a procurement contract with the Department of Small Business Services to provide the city of New York with certain tourism marketing services. In March of this year, along with everyone else, our world completely changed due to COVID-19. By the time April came, the NYC travel and tourism industry ground to a complete stop. The city that never sleeps went to sleep. The 400,000 direct and indirect jobs powered by the travel and tourism industry were thrown into limbo, upending the lives and businesses that make New York City so magical. Major events, meetings, conventions, sporting events, performances, and concerts were postponed or canceled. Restaurants, retail stores, theaters, cultural institutions, and sports arenas shuttered. Hotels closed altogether or transitioned from welcoming guests to housing emergency and frontline workers. Travel and tourism has long been a driver of economic prosperity and urban vitality for New York City. Last year marked the 10th consecutive year of growth in visitor spending, business revenues, job creation, new investments, and city tax revenues. The pandemic response has taken a noticeable economic toll on our industry's businesses and its workers. Let me give you a brief overview of the economic costs of the pandemic and subsequent pause we endured due to it. We can expect overall visitor spending in calendar year 20, uh, 2020 to drop by over two thirds, even as there has been a small pickup in weekend hotel stays. Last year, visitors spent over $46 billion in our city. This year, despite a good beginning in January and February, that number is likely to drop to about $16 billion as fewer visitors have fewer places and activities to spend money on. Additionally, hotel room demand, always a leading indicator, has fallen by about 68% since the start of the pandemic response in March 2020. At, at current occupancy levels, it will be off about 23 million room nights compared to calendar year 2019. Moreover, hotel taxes are likely to fall by almost $500 million compared to calendar year 19. Given this reduction in visitation and spending, especially by overnight travel and international visitors since March, the city's leisure and hospitality sector has lost more jobs than the information, financial, and professional and business service sectors combined. In August, leisure and hospitality jobs were down 49% on average. That represents over 231,000 jobs in New York City. But some business sectors even were more hard hit. Restaurant and bars, which rely on visitors for about one third of their revenues, have been the most affected in terms of actual number of jobs, a loss of 144,200 jobs as of August, down over 45%. It was good news that when seated dining became available, the restaurant sector added back 10,000 jobs between July and August this year. On the other hand, the smaller numbers in the arts, entertainment, and recreation sector have been harder hit. Six in 10 jobs in the sector are supported by visitor spending. As a result, in August, the sector has lost 65% of its jobs, a continuing loss of 62,400 positions, even as the city has begun to reopen for local residents. Driving much of this is the, jobs, uh, the loss of jobs in the performing arts, down 70%, a loss of 31,700 jobs. Museums are still off by 44%, even after beginning to open last month, but are still down over 6,300 positions. Even as the hotels have continued to operate on a limited basis, there has been a loss of almost half the jobs in travel accommodations, still down 24,000 positions in August. Therefore, it is evident the value that this industry brings to the city's economy, but also the uniqueness of New York City. On a personal note, as CEO, I face tough decisions for our own organization while dealing with the very loss uh, early on of one of our own colleagues to COVID. We had to assess our own physical reality as the city's destination marketing organization. In conjunction with board leadership and our executive team, we made difficult decisions that made us leaner and more nimble as the future remained uncertain for our industry and the city overall. Thus, we can relate to our industry partners and members who face similar challenges in order to survive. I have to say, I am incredibly proud of our staff who quickly pivoted to support the industry and our partners in government to ensure the city we love survives. This pandemic and economic fallout while going through these immensely difficult challenges at work and in their personal lives. <clears throat> NYC and company played a vital role in connecting, convening and supporting critical sectors of the economy from the earliest days of the pandemic. That responsibility addressed five key areas, supporting city relief efforts, providing advocacy support to the industry, driving immediate local spending through online platforms, make sure we continue to book future group and event business um, to lay the base for future success, um, and while still planning recovery efforts for the industry overall. From developing virtual opportunities to support NYC restaurants, retail and cultural communities, 
to assisting the city's Office of Emergency Management in finding hotel rooms for healthcare workers, NYC and Company continue to be a trusted resource and a pillar of strength for the industry. Our online platforms are Virtual NYC, Shop in NYC, Dine in NYC, and most recently, NYC Virtual Field Trips and NYC Virtual Site Visits for event organizers serve the immediate need of keeping residents and audiences around the world connected to our city through virtual content as stay-at-home orders were put into place. This allowed us to keep New York City's restaurant, retail, cultural sectors top of mind and gave opportunities for consumers to continue to support businesses and institutions they loved. As lockdowns began to ease, we pivoted to encourage real in-person engagements, launching a new promotion in support of artists, the creative community and the arts and culture sector with all NYC public art edition. Focused on outdoor experiences, it highlights free public art throughout the five boroughs as one way to begin safely exploring neighborhoods again. As racial unrest enveloped our country, we stepped up and created new content and messaging for our newsletters, website, and social media channels dedicated to support Black-owned businesses, restaurants, venues, and retail shops throughout the city. We continue that effort today and are, and are expanding it as we go forward. Falling under the Deputy Mayor of Housing and Economic Development's portfolio, we made sure our industry partners received the latest updates from the city and confirmed to her office what was happening on the ground as it pertained to tourism businesses. I was invited to support the Deputy Mayor along with Commissioners Casals and Del Castillo on the Mayor's Arts, Culture and Tourism Advisory Sector Council. Even working as a leaner organization today, NYC and Company remains dedicated to revitalizing the city's economy. We rely heavily on our government industry partners to do so. Therefore, in June, we brought together key stakeholders from across the boroughs, including public health partners, to establish the Coalition for New York City Hospitality and Tourism Recovery. The first, uh, the first objective of the coalition was to create a tourism recovery plan. And on July 7th, we released All in NYC, the Roadmap for Tourism's Reimagining and Recovery. Utilizing, utilizing our strength as a city's destination marketing organization, major components of this plan included our ongoing revitalization campaign, All in NYC, our health initiative, the Stay Well NYC Pledge, tactics for our renewed commitment to diversity and inclusive, inclusivity, especially in uplifting New York City's BIPOC communities, and how putting hyper-local exploration, along with staycation messaging, will be at the forefront of our initiatives until a time when domestic and ultimately international travel resume. From the onset, we have worked closely with EDC and Small Business Services to engage businesses, both big and small, to join in this important effort. I will now turn it over to our Chief Marketing Officer, Nancy Mamana, to discuss in more detail the All in NYC campaign. Nancy. Good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to share our work. All in NYC, our new revitalization campaign platform that Fred mentioned, launched alongside our coalition's recovery roadmap on July 7th. It's designed to help New Yorkers reconnect with the city they love and remind them that New York City remains the greatest city in the world. This deceptively simple tagline and idea embodies how New Yorkers feel about our city and is a reminder of all that it has to offer. This overall campaign objective is to revitalize New York City by inviting locals first and ultimately visitors to re-engage with the five boroughs we know and love. The campaign is being implemented in phases with a full funnel strategy. First, awareness, followed by our vibrancy campaign called Neighborhood Getaways, which involves citywide offers to encourage safe exploration. Later, it will be followed by a tourism campaign with timing to be determined, which will first encourage safe domestic travel and then international when borders reopen and travel restrictions allow. We released the All in NYC Business Toolkit to the public on July 30th. As of yesterday, over 200 businesses have gone all in by downloading it. This exclusive toolkit helps businesses go all in on the city's comeback by adopting the campaign's branding and rallying cry. It includes comprehensive brand guidelines, custom digital and print assets, and more details on our All in NYC opening up social media initiative designed to promote user-generated content created by locals and businesses. This particular initiative showcases the personal stories of New York City's signature resilience by asking residents and people who do business in New York City or own businesses in New York City to post videos and photos about how they're opening up and how they're all in on NYC and use our hashtag all in NYC. This content shares how they're getting back to work and reopening their doors, as well as what has given them hope over the last few months and how they will responsibly welcome back guests and why they're proud to call New York City home or the home of their business. As of this week, the total number of all in NYC hashtags is over 31 
75, 3,175, with 475 businesses that have contributed more than 850 stories and counting about how they're open and all in for NYC. Our new vibrancy campaign, All in NYC Neighborhood Getaways, launched on September 15th and is running in the local New York City area, within the tri-state area, and through the Northeast Corridor, with media running on local broadcast TV, taxi TV, Facebook, Instagram, Google search, and programmatic digital advertising, as well as in our out-of-home media through JC Deco and Link NYC. This program is the first of its kind, designed to suit the current moment. It's an invitation to New Yorkers and drive market visitors to safely rediscover New York City with nearly 200 participants to date. This program evolves our New York City Restaurant Week and New York City Must See Week into our largest program to date. The program has more offerings and includes hotels, restaurants, retailers, attractions, and cultural institutions. They're all open to participating, and it offers a platform for the breadth of New York City businesses that are open right now. It also offers more inclusion. For the first time, we're opening the program to businesses that are not currently members of NYC and company to ensure that there is support to all, given to all sectors throughout the five boroughs. It also offers more time. Instead of the usual two or three weeks, the program will run through the end of the year, and it potentially can extend into early 2021, depending on the current conditions. It also offers more flexibility. The program will offer further support by offering businesses the ability to create their own offer with minimal guidelines, as well as the opportunity to change those offers along the way. It also offers more targeting. We've improved the functionality on nycgo.com, our website, to facilitate deeper exploration by neighborhood with the goal of encouraging participation in multiple experiences during one trip or outing. Our advertising efforts will also target New Yorkers more specifically, especially in the program's early stages before expanding into the tri-state area and the Acela corridor. It's important to note that all of our messaging and creative reinforce the importance of public health and safety exploration, especially mask wearing, which we're showing prominently, in social distancing, in our photography, as well as in compliance with our Stay Well NYC pledge, which we continue to promote. Additionally, our All in NYC Neighborhood Getaways Toolkit is now available for use. MasterCard, our global partner, will support the program through a robust digital media campaign, as well as a compelling statement credit offer. Registered cardholders will be able to receive up to $100 in statement credits from qualifying participating businesses that are in the program. The credit provides $10 back for every $20 spent on experiences, which can include dining, retail, cultural organizations and attractions, or $25 back on every $100 spent on hotels, which is a great encouragement for staycations. It's totaled of up to $100 in statement credits allowed per car holder, uh, which is compelling. Participation in the program is free for businesses to join and sign up is this very simple process on our website. We welcome additional businesses to participate at any time. We're also now producing a series of video portraits featuring New Yorkers in the business community who embody the spirit of All In. Through interviews conducted via Zoom and socially distant shoots that took place at their place of business, the series tells stories of people who demonstrate resilience and compassion for their communities, reinforcing the foundation of the five boroughs. We will be releasing these in waves of five videos each, one per borough in paid social media starting this week. Lastly, we are required by contract with the city to utilize our international JC Deco out of home media allocation. So we therefore launched a new campaign entitled New York City Misses You Too, uh, in order to keep New York City top of mind for those visitors in Australia, Mexico, Peru, Spain, and the UK this summer. And it really acknowledges where we are at the current state. Uh, and we're grateful that we were able to keep that presence uh, internationally. We'd like to thank Chairman Vallone for providing a terrific All in NYC video spotlighting his district. We hope you will join him in providing your own personal social media posts showing your commitment to being all in for NYC and encouraging businesses and organizations to be all in as well. We would be happy to send the link to the toolkit afterward. I'll now turn it back over to Fred. Thank you very much, Nancy. As you all can see, NYC and Company has gone all in for New York City um, to boost our industry and stimulate demand from the audience at hand using a targeted hyperlocal approach while bracing for the unpredictable months ahead. While a significant number of small businesses, attractions, culturals, and hotels either remained open or are struggling to open now, there are still integral segments of our industry that cannot or have not been able to reopen, including many of our city's most storied sectors like Broadway, performing arts, nightlife, 
music and sports venues, in addition to large scale public events and major conventions and trade shows. Until the public health guidance and protocols are released so these sectors can safely reopen, a full economic recovery will be virtually impossible to attain. Without these vital demand generators, the full allure, allure of New York City as a destination will remain absent. For those of us watching the national and global picture on travel and tourism, we know that this will be a long road back and especially challenging for large city destinations. We understand this is a marathon, not a sprint, and are steeled for the long fight ahead to recovery. In the meantime, we believe demonstrating the strength and vitality of New York City through the all in NYC campaign will maintain the integrity of the city's brand. So when it is safe to do so, our 67 million annual visitors will begin to return and be welcomed once again to experience our city's rich and diverse offerings. In regards to proposed intro 1773A, while we appreciate the intent of this bill, given the city's current fiscal situation, it is our understanding that creating a new mayor's office would generate unplanned costs for the city. Therefore, it would make uh, compliance by the administration and NYC and company impossible. However, I would defer to the administration to discuss the state of resources available with the city council. From my organization's standpoint, the proposed office does seem duplicative to what NYC and company has always done and continues to do even in the pandemic. So we will continue to focus on our published recovery roadmap. I said at last year's hearing that tourism is often the forgotten economic engine for this city. These hearings provide an opportunity to display briefly the accomplishments of the tourism industry and NYC and company and how all in we are for New York City. Thank you for allowing us the time to testify. Nancy and I are happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, President Dixon. Uh, we'll now move to Commissioner Casals for testimony. Commissioner Casals, you may begin. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. And before I start with uh, my testimony, I just want to clarify that the Cultural Art 3 um, call was self organized by the sector, not by DCLA. That makes it even more important. Um, and, and it is because of the uh, passionate, dedicated leaders that we have in our sector that that uh, call continues to happen every day. Good morning, Chair Van Bremer, Chair Vallon, and members of the committees. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on the cultural sector impact on reopening New York City. I'm joined today by Deputy Commissioner Sheila Feinberg and External Affairs Director Ryan Max. In recent weeks, the reopening of cultural organizations has lifted the spirits of all New Yorkers. I have been visiting museums, zoos, gardens, and historic houses all over the city. It has been inspiring to witness and hear stories of people visiting the reopening cultural organizations. It brings them a sense of normalcy and makes them feel connected to their fellow New Yorkers. I've been to the Alice Austin House, the Bronx Zoo, MoMA PS1, which I had the pleasure of visiting with uh, Chair Van Bremer, and many others. All these places are beloved by their communities, and the reopening has marked a major milestone in our recovery from our ongoing public health crisis. For people who are worried from months of lockdown and who miss their social connections that make New York such a vital place, it's been restorative to have our cultural spaces return to us. I thank the cultural workers who kept these spaces uh, going, and I have taken an incredible care and, ha and have taken an incredible care to reopen them with the safety of visitors and staff front of mind. We have worked closely with our colleagues at New York City and Company on the campaigns All In NYC and Virtual New York NYC to promote cultural programming that's happening both in person and online. In embracing virtual programming and hyperlocal communities, organizations have found new audiences. This is why we're supporting the cultural community as it seeks to program in public spaces. It gives artists places to present work and perform. It gives residents local access to cultural activity, which is so important for the health and well-being of our communities. Last week, as part of our technical assistance programs, we hosted a webinar which brought together many of the agencies present to today's hearings, including parks, transportation, and citywide city events coordination and management. The seminar reminded cultural leaders of the process for putting on live events and public spaces in compliance with public health regulations. Over 400 people watched the webinar live and it's now available to view online. We have gotten great feedback and we thank the presenters for their time and their expertise. Cultural groups have already been organizing amazing work in New York public spaces. Queens Museum has partnered with the Street Lab on planning a series of outdoor art making workshops in October. The pop-up workshops will serve the families visiting the museum's food pantry, which they operate out of their facility in Flushing Meadows Corona Park. 
Magic in Plate Sight by the Target Margin Theater is a series of free socially distanced programs happening in parking lots, storefronts, stoops, and other locations across Sunset Park in Brooklyn. Snack Harbor's popular wellness Wednesdays invite local businesses like restaurants, dance and yoga studios, and Maker Park Radio to promote wellness activities as part of the Snack Community and Agricultural Program which has been providing fresh produce to residents throughout the pandemic. Despite months of hardship, cultural organizations have been engaging new audiences online and in their neighborhoods, and of course in public spaces. We're grateful to them and in all for the work. Digital programming helps sustain many of us through the spring and the return of a live cultural activities has been reawakened in New York City. From hyperlocal to regional to global, their work is being enjoyed by audiences across the world in these new platforms. I look forward to working with the council to support cultural groups through this ongoing challenge. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Commissioner Casals. I will now turn to Executive Director Canfield for her testimony. Executive Director Canfield, please begin when ready. Thank you. Good morning, Chairs Van Bramer and Vallone, Majority Leader Combo and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on permitting opportunities for cultural organizations, an issue dear to all of us. My name is Ellen Canfield. I am also a resident of Queens in multiple ways. I am the executive director of the Mayor's Office of Citywide Event Coordination and Management, CECM, which oversees the Street Activity Permitting Office, which many of you know as SAPO. I'm joined by my colleague, Stefan Grubauskas, director of SAPO. CCM serves as the broad umbrella overseeing and coordinating events and other temporary uses of streets, plazas, sidewalks, and parks. We are the one-stop shop for guidelines and permissions from agencies who ensure events are safe and positive for New Yorkers and visitors. From NYPD, FDNY, DSNY, to DOB and DEP. SAPO grants permits for streets, sidewalks, and plazas including signature events like the New York City Marathon to the smallest neighborhood block party. In a typical September, my office would be wrapping a busy summer of music festivals, street fairs, and parades. This year was a bit different. As soon as the pandemic hit and we made the difficult but necessary decision to cancel event permits, my team pivoted to providing interagency coordination to facilitate the quick construction and maintenance of hospital extensions, dozens of testing sites, temporary morgues, and now vaccine trial sites. Aside from immediate COVID response, we've mobilized streets and parks in brand new ways to support the priorities of reopening our city. Currently, we have reviewed over 475 outdoor learning sites with DOE and parks and streets. In addition to over 10,200 open restaurants, and 79 miles of open streets. In addition, we are currently permitting events and activations for hundreds of community organizations, nonprofits, and of course, cultural organizations. The mayor's executive order regarding event permits allows for small events. For streets, they must be one block or less and not interfere with open streets, outdoor learning, or other permits. And for parks, they must not interfere with the public's use of a park. In addition, the governor's executive order regarding non-essential gatherings makes it clear that events of this type must not exceed 50 individuals at any one time. We recognize these limitations are discouraging to those who are desperate to bring back performances and celebrations. The reality is that the opportunities we can safely offer are geared toward visibility, engagement, and of course, entertainment. Just this week, we issued permits for the Philharmonic to host pop-up performances in plazas throughout the city, a jazz trio to provide music for clients waiting for a meal at the Bowery Mission, and a nonprofit's art organization to hold a musical press conference in the heart of Times Square. We're even working on a pop-up drag show. Stay tuned. As long as the event is free and open to the public, these permits are free for the applicant. Well, the mayor's office and myself are undeniably in support of cultural organizations utilizing parks, streets, and plazas 
I'd like to address Council Member Van Bramer and Council Member Combo's legislation, intros 2034 and 2068, which may be duplicative of efforts the city is already taking. To speak to intro 2068, I believe that our existing permitting process is the safest, most efficient, and equitable way for all individuals and organizations to secure public space. We are committed to working with you and our fellow agencies in making sure the information about obtaining permits is as streamlined and accessible as possible. My office serves as a hub for any applicant interested in applying for a permit and DPR has a similar, a similar shop with their special events office. We both have staff available to answer truly any incoming email or phone call within 24 hours and are here to help organizations throughout the process. It's actually very unusual for permits to be denied by either office. We almost always find, an, find a way to make an event come to life, even under current COVID mitigation limitations. We will work to continue to work with DCLA and others to host webinars, attend meetings, and craft resources to help cultural organizations navigate use of public space. In addition, we're happy to present this information to any of your constituents. Regarding intro 2034, both Parks and SAPO currently utilize mobile-friendly online application forms and stand ready to provide translation and accessible application alternatives to those who may need it. In addition, there would be an additional cost associated with creating a new mobile app. The online application form for both agencies populates our citywide event management system, which allows us to coordinate with all of our support agencies, DOT, NYPD, FDNY, DSNY, as well as to identify and mitigate conflicts with existing open streets, outdoor learning, and outdoor dining. Using our existing application system is critical to maintaining safe and equitable use of public spaces. In closing, I look forward to working with the council and our sister agencies and continuing to support cultural organizations and utilizing streets, plazas, and parks. We all long for the moment we can sit in a darkened theater and wait for the curtains to open. But in the meantime, we have some beautiful stages across our city and we will support our beloved institutions in keeping the show going. Thank you. Thank you, Executive Director Canfield. I will now turn it over to questions from the chairs. Panelists from the administration, please stay unmuted if possible during this question and answer period. A reminder to chairs Valon and Van Bramer that you will be in control of muting and unmuting yourselves during this question period. Uh, Chair Valon, please begin. Thank you, Alex, and thank you to the um, panelists who just testified, and Fred and Ellen, the commissioner. I mean, there is so much to dive into. Um, and we are all united in making this great city shine again. So what we're, we're going to do is basically, um, Jimmy and I will talk about the state of cultural affairs and tourism, um, look at the bills that are here, and respond back and forth with the questions. I will kind of look at the then and now comparison from last year to now, the reality of the budget constraints and the different challenges of interagency coordination and the future of our recovery in tourism. Um, and I, Jimmy's gonna take care of the cultural side of that. What I'd like to do um, is quickly allow our wonderful majority leader, since she's got multitasking going on, a chance to do her questions now on her bill so that she can go to her next hearing. So Lori, if you uh, would like to jump in now before Jimmy and I start, that would be great. Thank you so much. Uh, this is a, a pleasant surprise to be able to be, um, I guess, fast-tracked in this way. So I thank you so much, Council Member Vallone. Jimmy and I uh, love you. <laughs> um, just wanted to, to start in with, um, I guess I'd like to start with the commissioner. Um, wanted to know, um, as far as with the Department of Cultural Affairs, how are smaller organizations at this time? Um, how are 
how are they faring in the reopening process, knowing that their capacity is far more limited than larger organizations? So really wanted to understand how within the Department of Cultural Affairs realm, how smaller organizations are faring um, during this process of reopening. That's a very um, interesting question. And we're seeing a couple of things happening. Um, of course, as um, cultural organizations are allowed to reopen, um, we're seeing that larger organizations are um, being able to um, react to um, the opportunity to reopen faster. That said, at the same time, we're seeing that smaller organizations, because they are leaner and they're much more flexible, are able to adapt to uh, new business models that could um, operate during the with the restrictions that brought by the pandemic. Um, however, um, what makes a big difference is, and you can see it on the, um, the uh, report that we put together after a survey mm -hmm. at the beginning of the pandemic, it is that the smaller culture organizations, the culture organizations that led, are led by, by POC and folks, or they are culturally specific, have been the hardest hit because most of their support come from um, foundation and government uh, funds. Given those different dynamics in terms of the financial model of those organizations that we know that a lot of them are very government, foundation, corporate heavy, and a lot of those resources have dried up, what has been the plan to shore up many of those organizations and to make sure that they sustain and survive during this time? So in the... Uh plans that we have to distribute the public funds that our my, my agency distributes every year and working closely with um, um, Chair Van Bremer, we put a, an equity lens in the way we want to distribute these funds with, a, again, um, um, prioritizing smaller cultural organizations. And we created a two, um, two, two funding streams um, that are specific um, around COVID relief to support organizations that operate in um, hardest hit neighborhoods by the pandemic, but also um, supporting communities that have been hardest hit. And then another one that is around arts education, which is another area that had been um, hard, hardest hit by um, the um, budget process. And we wanna support those organizations. So there's a COVID relief funding mechanism that's in place. So majority leader, I don't know if you remember, in addition to the, the funds that we distribute with what we call the Cultural Development Fund, we mm -hmm. used to have a line item that uh, was called SIAP, the Social Impact for the Arts, that was for a specific neighborhoods that um, we felt uh, they needed more support. We are re we're replacing that for um, both COVID relief and arts education uh, lines. And when will those funds be available to those organizations? So those are part of the, the, the process that we do in distributing funds in which 80% of those funds are coming in the uh, late fall. And then the 20% comes after the, uh, the, the, they provide the service that they're committed to provide um, in, the, um, in the early, um, in, in the summer. Okay, so, so this is not necessarily new funding, it's just funding that's being allowed to be redirected for a new purpose. It's uh, what we're doing is the funding that we distribute every year has been um, refought with an equity and uh, lens in mind. Now, let me just ask you this question Al along with that, um, with the distribution of these sorts of funds, will the organizations be able to access those funds in the fall or will they be awarded in the fall? Uh, the, the, they would be getting the 80% of the, you know, the full um, designation um, in the late fall. Okay. So getting closer to asking questions about the, um, about the legislation that is put forward, how now do you see organizations and smaller organizations accessing um, the ability to have accessibility to open spaces to do work? So I'm really excited about how quickly the restaurant industry was able to transition in terms of recognizing that they couldn't have um, 
indoor dining that they were able to transition very rapidly and quickly to outdoor dining and to utilize spaces and to have the infrastructure done to do that. Has there been a similar model for smaller cultural organizations to snap into programming in that way? Yes, that, that model has existed for many years, which is um, um, working with uh, both um, SAPO and Parks Department in getting permits to access those spaces. And because of uh, the situation, uh, working closely with those two agencies, we were able to, as I mentioned in my testimony, um, do a refresher for cultural organizations on how to access those spaces. And it has been extremely welcomed by the sector. Um, the, the possibility to clarify exactly who do you go to um, when you need to um, activate one of these spaces. And we want to continue to um, support those organizations throughout the fall um, to do the work. So if I were a small organization in Brooklyn, New York, yes. uh, is, and, and I want to do some outdoor programming, maybe not necessarily in Brooklyn, New York, maybe I say, I want to do a five borough event. Hey. Is there a central place right now that's easily accessible where I could see and point to all of the accessible places in the five boroughs to easily be able to say, I want to have it in this park. I'd like to have something at this museum. I'd like to go to Snug Harbor. Then I'd like to go to the Bronx Zoo. Then I'd like to go to Kyla Gore Park. Like, is there something that would allow you to be able to say very easily without having to go to multiple websites and places, this is the one-stop shopping for DOT plazas. This is one-stop shopping for park spaces. This is one-stop shopping for other larger cultural institutions, let's say like the Brooklyn Museum or the Met that may have accessible spaces that they're saying, we're able to allow our steps to be utilized for an event, that sort of thing. So uh, uh, I'm gonna uh, short, uh, I'll give you a short answer and then you know defer to my colleagues in the other um, agencies, but uh, you certainly have a one-stop shop for everything that sparks and you certainly have a one-stop shop for everything that is um, public plazas and um, streets and you know open public spaces. When you mention the uh, the other cultural organizations, uh, that thing doesn't exist because um, we see them as a private um, private property, right? And each of them um, they relate to their partnerships with other cultural organizations in different ways. But like I said, you know, probably um, both um, Eileen and and um, Anthony, I think, is here for parks could speak a little bit more about you know the process of for permitting in, in parks and and streets. Certainly, thank you so much, Commissioner. Happy to jump in. Thank you, Councilmember Cumbo, and, and very excited to talk about this and also incredibly empathetic to the desire of applicants to um, access something very quickly. Just, we understand just the word application sounds onerous. And right. open, open restaurants had such a unique opportunity in that their footprint was immediately available and assigned to them. Restaurants have a storefront, that space in front, which works for the kind of service they deliver, was immediately identified in addition to the, park, the parking spaces in front of them, which for the most case are commercial parking spaces, not residential parking spaces. So when we talk about cultural organizations having some sort of space designated to them, as we know, many small cultural organizations might not even have um, a brick and mortar office or a storefront. So giving that sort of automatic space is just not possible. When it comes to identifying the spaces that are possible, but as, as commissioner said, there are really just two two agencies, parks, streets, and plaza. So SAPO and parks, that's it. There's no additional needing to go to DOT, nobody else. The second you come into contact with our agencies, you have someone walking you through the process of any additional permits that are needed to make sure your office, your event is safe. And I know we all want that. So for example, something taking place in a street, we're checking with MTA to make sure that buses are rerouted if needed. We're working with the fire department to make sure they can access the space as well as if they need to reroute any of their spaces 
We're working with DEP to make sure that the I'm sorry, the generators are certified. So while none of this sounds fun, we actually do that work. We work with applicants to check every box that's needed. Let me, I'm sorry to interrupt you because yes. a, a council member of alone has um, informed me that there are many panelists that wish to speak and I don't want him to regret allowing me to go ahead of the <laughs> chairs. So uh, I, I guess I want to like narrow in on the point that, that I'm trying to understand as well. So part of this legislation would be able to bring that one-stop shopping into one place um, and to streamline accessibility, but also in educating, informing, and promoting. And hopefully this would be a way that, you know, for the outer boroughs as well, in terms of NYC and co, something like this could be everlasting that there is an attractive streamlined way for you to see throughout the five boroughs at any given time, all of the dynamic programming that is happening in public outdoor spaces readily at your fingertips. So like for me as a mom of a three-year-old, I've grown a bit tired of going to the same park all the time because that's really the only thing that I know about. But it would be great if I could look on a site and say, oh, let's go to the Bronx today. They're having this, let's go here. All of these public programs are in our plazas and right here at our fingertips. You know, our local bid, uh, Fulton Area Business Association is having a street fair on this. You know, there's no, as far as I can understand, way for you to be able to easily and in an attractive way, um, because it can't just only be informative. It also has to be att attractive as well as um, promotional and exciting and sexy and fun and all of those sorts of things. But, but majority leader, um, leader, if you will, I, I think we're talking about two different things. One is the permitting process in which would allow for all that programming to happen. Mm -hmm. And the other one is the collection of that information, you know, and, and the marketing of um, everything that's happening in outdoors. That's right. So I want both. <laughs> All, I just in one, <laughs> all in one place. And then I'll, 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 I'll turn it back over to the chairs because I do have some time to be um, on this call because I'd like to get more in terms of questions related to the cost of developing the app. So I'll turn it back over to my chairs and I'm here. Thank you, Madam Majority Leader Rory. So to give us some perspective, I think the, um, what we had done in our last hearing was to focus with James Patchett and EDC as to the city's <clears throat> primary focus of healing and getting New Yorkers healthy to deal with the pandemic. And clearly these conversations that we're having today, we have had wanted to have them, Jimmy and the rest of the council and Corey earlier, but there is needed to get through this first phase, which is basically a lot of it is still happening. So EDC, and I know that Alex is here, um, cost is, as, a, as a major part of coordinating those phases of recovery for the city. And those phases of recovery for the city are often determined or dictated by what happens up in Albany and with Governor Cuomo and with Empire State. So what I'd like to do, and Fred, I know you're there at the, at the panel, but also with Alex, is how do we see the phase from recovery and testing, to rapid testing, to students going back to school, all of that has basically brought the city to a stop. It needed to happen, but I believe most interests at this point are saying we need to kickstart the next phase. I just wanted to hear what that next phase and when do you envision that to happen? Thank you, Chairman. We've been also joined by Council Members Barron and Moya. Um, thank you, Chairman Vallone, for, for the question. I'll be happy to start off. Um, from NYC and Company's perspective, restarting tourism um, is a gradual phase-by-phase -phase process. Uh, you know, we recognize the need to fish where the fish are, um, as they say, and, and instead of travelers having the potential to come from around the world right now with border closures, quarantine requirements, um, many airlines have actually taken down their routes. So, I mean, our, 
our capacity and infrastructure for travel has been greatly diminished at this point. Our opportunities are really hyperlocal and, and regional. The other, <clears throat> the other challenge is, is the quarantine requirements. And to your point, you know, it's been uh, terrific in keeping us safe. Um, and we absolutely support the proper public health protocols going forward. Just recognizing that as those quarantine requirements change state by state, it, it limits the opportunity for people to plan in advance. And, and we see it as a, as a real challenge to, to work around as we go forward. So in many ways, we, we are in full mode of promoting a local and tri-state visitation. Um, there are some, some challenges, of course, still, you know, we, we have to acknowledge the economic realities with, with a large number of the tri-state uh, population still unemployed. You know, the, the discretionary income is, is still, uh, you know, a real question mark. And, and we also recognize, you know, that there are some image uh, issues too, you know, without Broadway open, for example, you know, we like to often say, you know, New York City is not a consolation prize without Broadway. But for so many people, they look at the performing arts in particular as, uh, as a real symbol uh, for the city. So uh, promoting the arts and cultures that are open, open, especially the small businesses, which we all care so much about and really need them to, to survive, uh, to maintain the character of our city and its dynamism. Uh, you know, it is going to be a case by case situation. We remain challenged on the big event front convention and trade shows. We're seeing them cancel now into the first quarter of next year uh, because of the limitations on gathering. So it is it's a multifaceted uh, answer. Um, and, and we just have to navigate it one one piece at a time. Oh, I think that's I think that's exactly right. Fred, and I think that's why we're challenged with that multifaceted. Internet term. At least four. We are hindered. Sorry, I heard something. Uh, that was my son. <laughs> Apologies. Oh, well, yeah, you're probably you're my priest. Uh, that challenge is relenting, really. I mean, between federal state um, guidelines and restrictions, even the quarantine, if anyone comes to New York City or New York State, has to quarantine for 14 days. And we will hear from those in the hotel industry saying that is crippling um, anybody's ability to come. So, how can we have uh, someone as a quote tourist or a business? meeting convention if they have to commit to confirm to stay for 14 days, it just doesn't happen. Um, so there needs to have that coordination. How, how are you handling um, that decision-making process when it comes to New York State's- Hi. Fred, did you, uh, that would be for you and, and Actually, any of these questions, Alex, I know Alex is there from EDC, so if we can unmute Alex um, Costas for during this so that he can jump in from EDC's perspective. But my, my question is the challenge we're facing and when New York State makes a decision that affects this great city and every other city, how is that coordination handled? How is, are you getting the input you need? Thank you, Chairman Vlon. I wasn't sure if, if that was all the question. Uh, we're working closely with um, you know, the state authorities to get clarification on the quarantine orders in particular. And as the phases reopen, as, as most everyone on this call has experienced, you know, there are a multitude of questions that need to be answered about the specifics of the language and, and how it applies, uh, particularly for tourism. You know, uh, when you're dealing with groups and you're, you're dealing with people that are traveling from afar, um, there, there is a lot of nuance that has to be uh, weighed out. But we, we've had a, a good relationship in terms of communication uh, with the state on those issues. Um, the two chairs of the New York Forward Group have came and spoke to our coalition. So that's, that's been helpful. Um, we, we do continue to flag the challenges that, that the quarantines represent. Um, you know, of course, public safety first, um, but, but they, they remain hurdles. Have we had any input or similar jurisdictions and or cities or countries that have started to relax their quarantine that has assisted in their tourism recovery efforts that we could try to emulate? The, 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 thank you for the question, um, council member. The, the issue there is, is the, the target is moving, right? We, you know, we have, you may know, in a company, we have sister partnerships with, with Madrid and with London and Manchester and, and uh, Tokyo and Shanghai. Um, and, you know, in talking with our peers around the world, uh, you know, they're in various stages of locking back down or opening back up. Um, and this, uh, uncertainty is causing real challenges for them. You know, it's interesting to note here in the U.S., of course, New York has, has, was the unfortunate epicenter of the situation, obviously. And we were very concerned early on that that reputation was going to linger with us, you know, that people would say, oh, I don't want to go to New York because that was where COVID was. 
Um, the sad reality is, is that it, it is now everywhere. Um, so that, that mantle is no longer just on us. Um, so so uh, we are less concerned about the long-term effects there. But if you look at, for example, at the state of California um, or the state of Florida, they never instituted any quarantine requirements. So they, they have infinitely more opportunities. Now, uh, it's not my place to question the public health wisdom of that, but it, it does create a challenging environment, especially for event organizers. We've seen uh, meetings and events move to states where, where there are less requirements. Um, and, and that is beginning to happen in certain ways. And, and so we will, we will continue to be challenged as long as that's the case. Well, and I think that's, that's that ongoing challenge. And I think the first hearing and, and part of today was to basically highlight the work that you have done with EDC to bring the safe measures that we had and to thank the staffs that have done that because we couldn't even have this conversation if we haven't gotten the percentages to where we are. And I think that's why you're feeling the New York City diehard passion to say, let's, let's get this thing going. We've done what we need to do. Um, and that involves everyone that's here and all the passion that we have. Part of that recovery plan that you mentioned that you have phased out, so much of that is dependent on every one of the sectors that are here today. So whether it was the hotels, or the restaurants, or the artists, or Broadway, and I know Charlotte St. Martin would agree with you on your description of, uh, of how Broadway moves, so does the city, um, and how they're all interconnected. What I'm hearing and what the council members are also hearing is that there's the macro level and the micro. And at the micro level is, okay, if we're going to do an open streets program, then how do we actually establish it? And when the restaurants are given that opportunity, the ability to coordinate through and without agencies and guidelines and permitting and the real the realities of how a street is closed and who is the police protection for that street, who gets the barriers and who mon maintains and monitors that. It's just one example of the direct line of communication that is needed in order to make these new ideas succeed. And I can tell you firsthand that uh, the first, Jimmy and I had districts that had some of the first opening of the Open Streets program and we had it on Bell Boulevard. And as wonderful as it was, it was chaos in the first weekend or two on trying to figure out the responsibilities of all that. And, and the restaurants were very happy to have that opportunity, but there was not the guideline that city agencies, it's not New York and company, because again, this is, this is getting into um, procedural guidelines of what happens within permitting and, and they're not going to call New York City and company, they're going to call our office, they're going to call sanitation, they're going to call NYPD, they're going to call DOT, they're going to call building departments and figure out what the hell they have to do to make it a success. That's the challenge now as we start to look at these recovery plans, um, even for open heaters for restaurants and for Broadway and having a requirement that says only 50 people can meet in all convention spaces. Well, we have Marriott and Sheridan that can handle thousands of people, but they're same limited to the same 50 person limitation that a little restaurant has in their basement. That is a pinpoint example of, we can't have that type of decision-making and have the city handcuffed, trying to recover and reopen with that type of vision. And that doesn't involve, in my eyes, for you or the great team that you have. That comes from the administration, that comes from city agency listening to the folks that are here today. So what Jimmy and I want to do is hear those voices and they're going to give those stories as to some of the ones that we just mentioned as to the, to the limitations that they're facing based on that. So my, my thought would be on the budget aspect of that. I mean, last year you had record numbers of 66 million tourists and it was amazing the amount of the engine. I believe we're the fourth largest economic generator income for the city now. How are we able to transition to this year's budget fiscal impact and complete the vision that you so rightfully have put forth for us? How are we going to be able to do that for you? Thank you for the question, uh, Chairman. There are a number of questions around the fiscal challenges that remain. And, and to your point, you know, because of our public-private nature, we, 
we have lost about 60% of our private dollars. Um, that's, and they typically account for about half of our funding. So there, there's no question that, that, that the fiscal uh, challenges uh, will be with us into the near term. And, and we do see this as a long road to recovery. You know, you look at some of the estimates from, from different experts in the field, whether it's the hotel sector or it's the airline sector, and they see this being a two, three, even four year recovery process to get back to where we were in 2019. It will take a prolonged effort uh, to get there. And I would love to, uh, to talk with you more about that um, offline. And of course, we need to defer to our colleagues in the administration on, on budgetary matters, but, but there, there will be a need that will be with us for quite some time. So do you think based on that reality, uh, the smaller budget we're gonna have, that we should be investing everything we can to save tourism or we should cut back? Thank you for the question, um, Chairman. The reality is every destination in the country is going to be restarting at the same time. I mean, we're already seeing significant investment happening, uh, whether it's Florida, whether it's, it's uh, areas in the Southwest, California, that are beginning to ramp up their messaging. Uh, the consumers are gonna have a lot of choices. Uh, I feel very strongly that travel will return at the right moment. I'm very bullish on travel industry. I know everyone on this call probably feels the need to get out of their apartment and to go somewhere when it's safe to do so and you feel comfortable. So uh, I think there's gonna be significant pent up demand at the right point. Uh, being able to attract those travelers to our destination is going to require competitive budgeting. Um, and to be able to do that safely, you know, I think there, are, there is more conversation that, that will need to be had, but, but we are gonna be in a, in a really challenging environment to, to capture the travelers that are willing to, to move in the beginning um, and, and then to secure the, the business back into New York City uh, for the long term. You know, and I agree with you 100%. And, and that's why I think um, whether it's a bill like today or hearings today, it's, it's supporting that vision and what the council can do to partner. And unfortunately, the council members that are here today, and uh, we are often unable to provide that direct source of support, whether financially or legislatively or through getting a dedicated stream of employees and our staff or resources to New York and company and to this sector and to cut through the bureaucracy and the red tape that so many of our businesses are, are faced with or whether it's an unrelenting regulation. Um, that is why, and that's to the heart of why we are proposed the legislation today in 1773, and I'll, I'll come back to that, but to cut through and to speed and to give your great team the additional resources and a dedicated staff on the administration level to listen to each of the groups that are going to come and the advocates to speak is so critical now. And in my eyes, and I believe you're going to hear from everyone else's eyes, this is not the area to cut back on. We need to strive and thrive, as Jimmy said, to bring and support our cultural affairs and especially within our tourism. I, I would like to, just before I turn it over to Jimmy, you know, we, we, we can't get into all of that and we're gonna let the council members after Jimmy Van Bramble have their time to ask some of the questions like majority leader Cumber did. But is there any other areas that you would say, Fred, that within the city that have been hindering or impacting tourism that we as council members and as legislators could assist you in addressing. One of the areas that come to mind is obviously quality of life, right? So if a tourism or a tourist or a family or someone wants to have a convention or come here, they want to experience the quality of life that once existed here in New York City, but is now very difficult to obtain. How, how are you able to, to wade through quality of life issues and, and getting the support of community and civic groups and the NYPD and, and when there is an issue on a particular area to address that? Thank you for the question, Chairman. And, and those are important issues that affect not just visitors, but, but New Yorkers, um, you know, every single day. And we believe in supporting our government partners like the council and the mayor's office and providing you all with as much research and insight as to what is happening on the ground. And we will we'll be happy to continue to do that. I know, mem I know many of our private industry partners um, are on the call today and will be testifying and can speak more specifically to, to those issues. But we provide opportunities for our, our members and partners to hear directly from agency heads and elected officials um, to connect the, those communication channels. And, and we've been successful in doing that so far. We know the challenges are many but I, I would need to defer to the agencies who work on those issues every day to answer that more specifically. 
Thank you, Fred, for your testimony. I look forward to, as always, working with you and your team. And we'll we'll circle back after Co-Chair Jimmy Van Bramer has his questions. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Vallone. And, and I want to start off by saying that I believe that every single person uh, representing every single agency here wants the cultural community to succeed and thrive. But I have to say that the status quo isn't good enough that the city of New York isn't doing enough to save our cultural organizations and institutions, particularly those small ones. Fred said before, 70% of performing arts jobs have already been lost, right? Nearly 250,000 jobs in the cultural sector alone. And while I understand that there are existing uh, permitting application processes and agencies that do some of this work. There is no question in my mind that we have to do more and we have to do better and we have to do it faster to save cultural organizations and institutions when they are literally uh, at uh, the brink of, of dying as an organization, as an institution. And um, again, all due respect to everyone on this call, um, but uh, Ellen at SAPO talked about the most equitable way uh, of doing this. And, and I think the most equitable way of establishing a permitting process that is easy, quick, and free that gets more artists back to work and allows organizations to perform and charge for that work is to have a self-certification process just like open restaurants. I have heard from many of my restaurants who were thrilled that when the mayor created the program and the city created the program, that they went on to the website, filled out the application, and literally within minutes got back the approval so that they could start to set up uh, their outdoor seating. And while I understand the logistics are uh, somewhat different, uh, particularly as um, someone mentioned, some of our, many of our smaller cultural organizations don't have brick and mortar space, but that's not a reason not to do open culture. That's a reason to do open culture uh, because they don't have a venue and they need a space to perform, rehearse, and charge for performances so that they can pay artists and we can get some of that 70% of performing artists who are out of work back to work. So I just wanna challenge the notion that the city is doing all it can and that we can't do more. That's what open culture is about. That's what this bill is about. Uh, and, and, you know, SAPO parks, have processes uh, and you know the jazz trio performing and and the pop-up philharmonics are great but what many of our organizations desperately need is uh, is a program is a path forward is stability is the ability to plan uh, a series of performances uh, dare I say a season, of performances because that's how so many of our cultural organizations operate. Uh, and, and to be able to start to do that outdoors, yes, everyone knows it must be done safely, but that, that it be done quickly uh, and that we get back. Um, Fred also talked about giving people a reason to visit New York City. It's also giving people a reason to stay in New York City is having the ability to look forward to a dance performance uh, in a park, uh, a ballet on an open street or in a public plaza. We can do those things. I know we're doing some of it, but there's no question that we could do more of it. We could do it more quickly uh, and we could make sure that this application process is as streamlined as the open restaurants uh, and, uh, and these organizations can start to promote uh, the performances that they want to have. So I just want to uh, uh, ask Commissioner uh, Casals, um, 
I know that uh, we are working together, all of these agencies, uh, and I know that we are granting uh, some permits and some performances are happening, um, but could we be doing more? And uh, could a program like Open Restaurants, uh, if it were to be translated to open culture, uh, allow more performances to happen more quickly and allow for us uh, to allow people to charge and pay artists? And isn't that what we really want to happen at the end of the day? Um, yes, we could do, be doing more and we're doing more. Um, I just want to bring a couple of notions uh, to this conversation um, that might help us um, figure out what's the best uh, solution for this. And number one, and I just want to, if you allow me to get personal for a minute, um, I got sick with uh, COVID um, in early March and I was sick uh, for five weeks, two of them in the hospital. And I don't want any of us to forget, you know, what New Yorkers went through um, during, at the height of the pandemic. And I want to remind all of us that the, the um, administration's priority is still the safety of New Yorkers, right? And as we continue to um, keep, you know, the, uh, the, the curve of the pandemic very flat, um, one of the reasons we're keeping it really flat is because we're being extremely careful in how do we reopen and we recover. Number two, the challenge that we're up against, and specifically with um, um, performing arts organizations, is that their, um, the experiences that they offer are um, unique. Um, when we were able to uh, get um, living museums and zoos and botanicals reopen, it was mostly because they were happening outdoors. When we were able to get museums, um, indoor museums reopen, it was because the experience that they, regardless of the content of what they're offering, the experience that they um, were offering, it was very much the same. Um, the possibility of being outdoors with a control number of uh, people in each uh, gallery space, socially distanced and following all the CDC and state um, protocols. The, yet in many conversations that I'm having with the performing arts sector is what is the model that we can create um, in the meantime, while we cannot be all sitting in a theater um, together watching a performance. And the challenge is that, you know, it, it just, we are not able to find exactly what that experience looks like. And so when you're talking about self-certification, and again, I'm gonna let, you know, my colleagues on the permitting um, agencies respond that, but the biggest challenge of self-certification with performing arts is that each and every one of the programs that are being um, proposed for permitting look very different. Unlike you know, a restaurant that can take you know, the front of their um, sidewalk and it, it, they all look the same, right? You know, it's, it's tables, you know, socially distanced, um, a certain amount of people. Um, when we talk about performing arts, it's crowd control, the expectation of how many people is gonna gather. Um, there are so many um, variables that um, it, it becomes very difficult not to treat them on a case by case basis. So uh, commissioner, Needless to say, uh, we are friends for a long time and I'm grateful that you are uh, um, recovered uh, and, uh, uh, and, and looking really good in your uh, library you. there. Um, I, I, I do wanna just say that while we are obviously very different than restaurants, um, I'm glad you you still acknowledge that we can do more and we can do better and we can do faster. Um, no one wants uh, anyone uh, to be endangered, but we are already uh, doing some outdoor performances, but we just need to do more, we need to better and faster and streamline this in a way that uh, uh, makes, uh, gives us the ability to put more people back to work as fast as possible. And, and uh, you know, if the, the city uh, isn't ready uh, to uh, provide uh, additional financial support to our cultural organizations and doesn't have the ability to do so, um, although I believe that we could find a way to do that, we would just have to um, uh, do some other things and prioritize uh, culture and the arts over uh, the NYPD, for example, but 
I will say that uh, in the absence of that uh, commitment or political will to uh, provide literally life-sustaining uh, uh, grants, uh, not loans, but grants to cultural organizations, then we have to find a better way to allow artists and cultural organizations to get back to work uh, and to uh, make money and uh, provide. Because, and I'm a huge supporter of the open restaurants and I am a huge consumer uh, at the open restaurants program, but um, the artists and the cultural uh, community is, is just as important um, and, and uh, generates so much revenue and linking it to tourism uh, gives people and will give people a reason uh, uh, to come back uh, to the city. Um, and because we all are experiencing uh, some, some friends and uh, uh, colleagues who are leaving the city, uh, reasons to stay in the city. So I would hope the administration would work with us uh, to create a program that is sustainable, workable, and safe and that we get everyone back to work. Uh, that's what uh, open culture is all about. And I've certainly heard from so many folks, whether it's from the League of Independent Theaters and other uh, small nonprofit cultural organizations uh, that uh, we aren't doing enough. And the city has not prioritized uh, this as much as it should have. And, and that's my job to push harder, push further and demand more and for this community that I represent. And I know that you love Commissioner Casals just as much as I do. Um, and if someone uh, on the panel wants to talk about the Save Our Stages uh, resolution and the importance, uh, obviously, uh, um, you know, Broadway is incredibly important and generates enormous revenue and brings lots of people uh, to our city. Uh, but all of our stages do, um, uh, all of our performing artists do, and whether it's the Chocolate Factory Theater in Long Island City uh, or um, the biggest uh, Broadway show um, uh, currently going. Uh, so uh, I don't know if Fred or, or, or Gonzalo wants to uh, uh, speak to the importance of uh, the Save Our Stages legislation going through the federal government and, and how we as a city desperately need that. Thank you, Chairman. This is Fred. I'll be happy to go first. And, and we share your passion uh, for the recovery of the arts and cultural organizations. I mean, we see it in our research. We, we hear it, um, you know, from our trade partners in the media, you know, the intense focus on the recovery of the arts and culture sector. Um, and, and we recognize that as such an integral part of the fabric of the destination of New York City, when we talk about just travelers, um, you know, it, it is integral to their desire to come to the city. And while Broadway is often at the forefront of that, you're absolutely right. It, it extends to every stage of every size. And we, we applaud the Save Our Stages legislation um, and, and we support its passing and, and uh, you know, we stand ready to support in any way, but I would need to defer to our friends in the administration um, on, on other thoughts. I mean, I echo everything that uh, um, Fred just said, and a reminder that uh, um, uh, by um, early May, the cultural sector had lost half a billion dollars in, in um, revenue um, alone. And we're looking forward to do another um, survey at the end of the year to, because it's a crisis that continues to unfold. All this to say that this is a problem that is much larger than the city of New York and the state of New York. And we need to continue to advocate in front of the uh, federal government, not only to um, support uh, cultural organizations, but support you know, um, local municipalities to bring back the, uh, the, the work that uh, cities like New York have been doing for so long. Uh, I, I know I'm going to uh, end here but I, uh, and throw it back to uh, uh, Chair Vallone and, and our colleagues. Um, but I just want to once again state uh, unequivocally because, um, um, you know, someone mentioned the phrase before about cultural performances not interfering with the use of public parks. Um, uh, this would be an ideal use of public parks and public space. Uh, this is exactly why we have public parks and public plazas and, and public spaces and open streets is for 
uh, people to feel alive and for people to be entertained. And in a time when we are desperate, desperate uh, to dance and sing and laugh and feel some joy that we would allow and pay the cultural artists uh, uh, and, and sector uh, to do that work. Yes, safely, first and foremost. Uh, I believe we can do more, we must do more. And uh, this bill, uh, these bills are ways of pushing uh, this administration to doing more and taking this more seriously and prioritizing uh, this sector uh, just as we rightly did our restaurants and small businesses. Um, and that's been a great success. Uh, but let's make uh, getting the cultural community back to work an equally great success. That is something we have to do. With that, uh, I'll have more questions later, but thank you and back to you, Chair Vallon. See, and that's why we are so lucky to have had almost 12 years of Council Member Jimmy Van Bramer leading cultural affairs because that passion. However, I don't think you want me to dance or sing, but other than that, <laughs> I think we definitely do want to generically get back to dance and singing. Um, Paul, it might be very entertaining to watch yeah. you dance, though, I'm just going to say. You know, married 26 years, I think my wife might agree. We'll see. Uh, and Commissioner, I, I do feel for what you went through. My entire family went down in March and April. And I think that's why this hearing is such a delicate balance between the health the safety of our New Yorkers and getting our economic engine going. Um, and why you hear the, will hear also that, that need to get it going. So what I'd like to do now is have the council members who've been waiting and have their hands up. So I'm gonna turn it back to our legislative council and committee council, uh, Alex Polinoff, to call on our council members. And then Jimmy and I will wrap up with the second round with the panelists. And then we want to hear from those that are affected most that are waiting to hear so we can hear their story so that those are the answers that we can give today. So Alex, I turn it back to you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I will now call upon council members in the order that they've used the Zoom raise hand function. If you'd like to ask a question and you have not used the, the Zoom raise hand function, please do so now. Council members, you will have a total of five minutes to ask your questions and to receive an answer from the panelists. The sergeant at arms will keep a timer and will let you know when your time is up. Once I have called on you, please wait until the sergeant has announced that you may begin before asking your questions. Uh, first, we will hear from uh, Councilmember Powers, followed by Councilmember Joni. Councilmember Powers, you may begin. Time starts now. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I'm so excited for this hearing, um, and I, I do agree with this is something that I think we all aspire to do earlier, but now we are really seriously thinking about the future here of tourism. I'm in my office in Midtown and uh, undoubtedly things have been changed in terms of the real life. I wanna thank Fred and everybody else for their work to bring, uh, to try to make sure people understand that New York is still a destination and even locally here, we have to be doing our domestic tourism and visiting new neighborhoods and seeing new sites here. And um, I wanted to, you know, before, I only have a few minutes because I have to run and I apologize, but. I wanted to A, echo my support for I have my savior stages face mask that I wore to work today and I could not say any stronger or louder how important that piece of legislation is in the, uh, in, and I wanna thank uh, uh, Councilman Van Bramer for his resolution, uh, which I'm signing on to, and it is uh, imminent and I really ask all of us to direct our efforts. We have a number of venues here who are on uh, the call today and uh, for myself, I know some others on this call as well. That is where we go to get our mental break is go to see live music and live performances, Broadway as well. And I really encourage everybody to go and um, look up that piece of legislation and call your legislator and ask them to sign up, uh, sign on to it. Um, so I am directing you to go do something to another legislator. Um, but I'm really hope we pass that, that resolution. And it's a really, really good one. So thank you. Um, to Chair Van Bramer. Um, I'm gonna ask this question just to Fred. I mean, just on the same topic, maybe you can give us some direction. I know we are not a health expert, uh, but you know, I think one of the challenges here for a lot of the live performance venue, and so I wanna just add one thing, which I really agree with what Chair Van Bramer said, which is like any way we can use outdoor space, parks or anything to sort of lead the way when it comes to the rebuild around the arts, when it's a difficult time, I think we should be doing uh, anything we can. Um, Fred, maybe you could just give us some insights on what you're seeing in other cities, but also what your expectations here is like, 
it is going, it seems to me still far away from when I'll be able to walk into a uh, performance venue. Um, but, uh, and that's sad, it's made. But, um, but what, what are you, you know, what are you seeing or what, are you, what is your kind of your belief in terms of when you think we will be you know, able to tell other folks to be able to come to New York City or even local New Yorkers and to be able to go see a live performance uh, in an indoor venue? Thank you, Council Member uh, Powers, for the question and for your support always. And, and I share your uh, need to do that. You know, I mean, there is no tourism recovery without arts and culture recovery. I mean, it is as simple as that. I think New York is the arts and capital culture of the world. Um, and we have to, to nurture that industry uh, back to health uh, to make sure that the tourism recovers. You know, as, as you said, I'm not a public health expert, so it's difficult for me to say. Um, the one thing I will point out is that it is it is creating a, a, a challenging environment as other destinations across the country begin to reopen. You know, we saw uh, just last week that Miami has now moved to 50 percent capacity for performing arts venues um, and nightlife as well, by the way. I mean, it's in theater. So it, it's it's uh, of course, they don't have the scale and scope of the industry that we have in New York. Um, but but I know it's a source of frustration for our partners in the arts of every size um, when they see other organizations being able to move ahead. Um, now, of course, time will tell if that was the right decision or not. Um, you know, we have to maintain safety as the first uh, priority, but, but we, we are watching those, those issues closely. Um, and, and, you know, we are actually doing some sentiment surveys right now to understand, you know, what uh, is holding uh, consumers or individuals back from the tri-state region for coming into the city. And, and we feel pretty strongly that it will, it will say that it's the demand generators that they're missing, right? It's, it's performing arts especially, but it's arts organizations uh, you know, of all size, uh, but especially performing because we're seeing, of course, the visual arts um, or the, you know, the museums, of course, being able to reopen now to some degree. So um, it, it remains really challenging. It's difficult to say. Um, you know, we, we absolutely support the, the Save Our Stages legislation. Um, we also implore the Senate to, to pass additional relief bills for, for nonprofit organizations in particular, which many of the arts organizations are. So I would defer to others in the administration for their thoughts. All right, I'll just ask one more question and then I'll, uh, I'll hand it back over. Um, what are other, I mean, just, just can you outline some strategies you think the council can take now, I mean, in addition to some of the bills we have here today to help in the recovery and rebuild. And I think, I, for sure, I think one of them is just public messaging. Like, I do think public transportation is safe to take and people should feel safe on it. I think the city is, the rhetoric around the city is sort of uh, uh, being an anarchist jurisdiction, I think certainly is ridiculous and doesn't help. But, you know, beyond that, can you tell us other some strategies you think we should be looking at and employing here as we talk about rebuilding? Thank um, you for the question. I'm sorry. Go, thank you for the My question. Time. Yeah, yeah. yeah thank ahead. you for the question, Council Member. And I will just say, you know, um, Council Member um, Valone has already submitted his video showing how he is all in for NYC. I mean, you pointed it out. You know, there's there's a continuing wave of neg negative negative uh, you know publicity coming at us uh, from across the country in a variety of ways. Um, it, it's important to remind the world right now, and we need everyone to be all in on New York City that we are now the safest place in the country from a COVID perspective. I think sharing that is really important how folks who are able, and we have to recognize that, that more, some people in our community are more impacted by COVID-19 and are not comfortable getting out. And we have to recognize that. But those that are out um, you know, using their social media, using their voice to, to say how they're all in for New York City, you know, we, we have to show the world that the city is reconnecting with itself and express our vibrancy as it rebuilds to the world. That's what's gonna encourage people to come back. Got it. Well, I have lots of places I'd love to advertise them. <laughs> So let me know when I need to do my video. Um, anything you guys you know, feel like you need from the council to help um, really lead the charge for folks to feel to, safe to um, be here, but also you know, just to get around the city and go see new places. It's a good opportunity to do that. We, you know we stand here in support. And uh, like I said, save our stages. That's what they down. Save our stages. Uh, it's so very important. I want to thank all the venues who are here today. A lot of them jumped on last minute today to come and testify. Um, I know they're really hanging on. I want to thank them all for being here today. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Councilmember Powers. Uh, we will now turn to Councilmember Joe and I for questions. As a reminder to the other council members, if you do have questions, please use the Zoom raise hand function. Councilmember Joe and I, you may begin. I'm starts now. Thank you. I want to thank the chairs and all of you that are testifying. But it really sounds like we don't have a comprehensive plan when our default is safety of New Yorkers and budget cuts. 
And I say that with the understanding of safety and how important it is. But when we are opening up schools, our transit from buses and trains are open and even airlines where I recently traveled and now we have even partial indoor dining. I think we have to start stepping away from that we have, it's about the safety. And we have to start focusing on this new world and shaping this new normal, whatever it may be, because I truly do believe open restaurants, open retail, open arts can be done safely in this city. So whether it be save our stages, save our parks, save jobs, save small business, it all translates to save our city, our neighborhoods and communities. It really comes down to save New York City's stolen economy, which sets us apart from any other city in this country. In a recent meeting with Commissioner Castillo of the Mayor's Office of Media, we discussed how we can build traffic and business to not only local mom and pop shops, but also the arts. Subsequent to the conversation, I started the process to introduce legislation that will educate people on the benefits of shopping local and the impact that will have on our local economy. And I just wanna point out, a study in Chicago found that for every $100 spent at a local business, 68 remained in the city, while only $43 out of every 100 spent on a chain retailer. And I can't even think of what Amazons of the world are taking out of our local economies. Plus, shopping local is a multiplying effect. Other studies have found for every dollar that someone spends locally, it generates six dollars for New York. And I'm sure some of you are more familiar with the with the studies. That's a return of six hundred percent. In real terms, that means more money for local jobs and an increase in tax revenue for the city and state, which would start answering some of the deficit problems that we have in our budget. Every dollar that we invest in opening up business is a, it, it will contribute to our tax base. So when are we gonna start thinking out of the box? And I'm, I'm looking at you, Fred, in particular, I'm looking at EDC uh, and all of those of you that spend day in and day out, making sure that our economy is healthy. You have a big responsibility here. I'm not relying on this administration. I'm relying on all of the expertise on this committee to come up with real ways and real plans. We need to look at how we can have, we refer to the open restaurants. Why can't that be applied to all retail shops? A similar program um, for entertainment and our arts. I can envision outdoor events in tented areas at the Bronx Zoo and Botanical Gardens on Palm Bay, which is the largest park in New York City. And we can do it safely to more efficiently utilize sidewalk and outdoor space that will deal with the impact of reduced foot traffic and tourism. Can't wait for tourism to rebound. I think you said it, Fred, where you fish where the fish are. Well, New York City has 8.6 million residents. That's a healthy barrel of fish to be looking at. And the educational component of staying local, shopping local, keeping every dollar within our community is where I'm headed. So the question is, the benefits are clear. What are we going to do as a city to help boost the local economy and businesses for the residents, for the residents and the limited number of tourists that are coming to New York City due to this pandemic? And I'm hopeful that I can get some real answers and it shouldn't be about safety and budget. Every dollar we invest in reopening our businesses will yield us a return. That's not a familiar strategy to many of those that work for this administration. There is a return on every dollar that we put into this system when it comes to small businesses and that includes our arts and culture. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Jonai. We'll now turn to Majority Leader Combo for questions. Majority Leader Combo, you may begin. Time starts now. Thank you. I just wanted to uh, further explore, uh, Gonzalo, excuse me, Commissioner, in terms of issues around private 
sponsorship or support for the arts. So for example, have there through the Black Lives Matter movement or other corporations, or I'm hearing a lot in terms of celebrities and those sorts of things, have there been other entities where we've been able to engage in public private partnerships in order to shore up the arts to create somewhat of a very real relief fund for many of those organizations? Not that I'm aware of with a private, um, um, private um, individual donors. Um, we um, have been um, using the survey that we created uh, for to gauge uh, the impact of COVID on our culture organizations as a way to advocate both uh, with the state, with the uh, federal government, and also with uh, private foundations. Um, and you can see um, both the, the largest foundations that are based in New York, Ford and Mellon, um, continue to invest in COVID relief in, in our city. I think I, from my time in the council, I've seen those types of public-private partnerships. I think we have to go more proactively in terms of really trying to create that type of fund that would produce those types of um, opportunities. I also wanted to ask uh, with uh, Fred Dixon as well, have there been any concepts in terms of thinking about how to take the restaurant outdoor dining program and partner it with uh, outdoor cultural programming so that a restaurant perhaps and a cultural organization within that vicinity or within that borough could partner and we figure out some way that that could also be funded or sourced in some sort of partnership way. Has that thought been brought to the table? Thank you, uh, council member for the question. It's great to see you. Uh, I, uh, yes, absolutely. In, in fact, early on in the pandemic, uh, we engaged in conversations with the cultural community through our coalition and steering committee um, and, and directly with other constituents um, to talk about how that could happen. We agree there's tremendous allure and appeal um, in the outdoor opportunities uh, for arts and culture. Um, and I, I will just point everyone back to our roadmap for recovery. Um, if you haven't had a chance to see it yet, you can find it on our website at nycgo.com slash recovery. And, and you'll see um, many of these pieces outlined in the plan. We published it on July 7th. And uh, we, in fact, as Nancy alluded in our, in our presentation, you know, our global payment partner MasterCard has stepped up in remarkable ways to help fund the All in NYC Neighborhood Getaways plan, uh, promotion rather, that we launched last week. And it is the most comprehensive uh, local promotion NYC company has ever done in our history. Um, and it's incredibly expansive. Um, and we're, we're providing cash back statement credits for anyone to get out and support the arts locally, restaurants, and, and certainly hotels and retail. Um, and a lot of that is focused, of course, on small businesses and small arts organizations that, that are open. We also have geared our website. If you, if you explore on nycgo.com, you'll see how we, you can find out what is open today. Um, and you can find out what is available around it to help we recognize the need to create itineraries, right? So if you're drawn for one particular reason, whether it's a public art piece or a performance, um, that you need to know what's mm -hmm. open around it so you can make it, make it all into one trip. Let me, let me just interrupt there. Um, I think we need to make it more of a real structured program. I, I think that that's really definitely one way to go about this, to make it a real partnership that's easy to navigate. I also wanted to ask, are you familiar with an initiative within the council called the Theaters of Color program, Fred? Yes, yes, I am council member. So when an initiative like that exists, because frankly, we all know when we're talking about culture and the arts and even small businesses, the numbers are staggering when we talk about how it's gonna impact communities of color. How do, you, uh, how do you see in terms of tourism, how do you work and navigate with those types of organizations and initiatives similar to that in order to boost those types of organizations within New York City's tourism plan? Uh, I'd, thank you for the question, council member. And we'd love to talk with you more about that offline because I uh, recognize that it's probably a longer conversation, um, but we have prioritized black owned businesses in our content um, just of late actually. And we have a strategy we're about to put in place to elevate that even more uh, with new dedicated content. And uh, there's a tremendous opportunity to tie those, uh, those theaters and those organizations into the larger promotion as they are able to reopen. And, and I would love to explore that more with you. 
I would really like to explore that because in my time, I've never really seen the city promote and bolster those organizations of color, particularly theaters, visual arts spaces, and many others. And I think now is a critical time to be able to find those types of partnerships where we could work with an initiative like the theaters of color, when we can work with many of our visual arts spaces to partner them with restaurants, to partner them with outdoor spaces. Like it has to be far more robust. And I think that the city of New York could greatly benefit from promoting its organizations of color um, on the same level as many of our mainstream institutions that the city is more identified for. So this is a tragedy that we are experiencing but it's also an incredible opportunity to finally uplift those organizations. And we have to do it quickly because organizations like the Theaters of Color, those types of initiatives have been around for some time. We have not, we have not explored how to adequately lift them up and raise them up to the level that they could sustain themselves, especially during a time when the economy is challenged, but also so that they could thrive and they could add further to the identity and why people are coming to New York City. And those are all my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Majority Leader. Are there any other council members with their hand up, Committee Council? Seeing no additional council members with their hands raised, I'll turn it back to the chairs. Uh, Chair Belong, the floor. Thank you, Alex. Um, and I can see the unity here on us trying to speed through into this recovery and to make sure that we get the resources we can. I'd like this to unmic um, Alex Costas from ADC. ADC is our ultimate landlord of city property and has an extremely large budget compared to the other folks that we're talking to. Um, Alex, what is your vision here on partnering with the Road to the Recovery for Tourism and what EDC role will be in that recovery? Sure. Uh, thank you, Chair Vallone. And again, uh, echoing Fred's sentiments, thank you for uh, your all in video. It's just a great way to showcase the ways that people can go out and enjoy the city safely, which I think is what we're all hoping to do. So uh, as mentioned uh, earlier, you know, first and foremost, we are all committed to making sure that the city does recover and rebound as quickly as possibly. Um, you, you touched on earlier, EDC's focus, uh, you know, right from the start was uh, on health and response, whether it be manufacturing PPE, all the way up to now, uh, setting up a new uh, lab facility to increase the speed at which test results get back. At the end of the day, uh, you know, health, health is, is going to be the start to all of this recovery. We've been working in lockstep with Fred, Nancy, and team at NYC and Company to push the all in, all in NYC message out there. Um, our audience is typically the business audience, so uh, you know corporations, academic institutions, and we have taken the really uh, terrific rallying cry of all NYC and brought that to our audience. So that that's taken the form of uh, you know hundreds of phone calls or over 100 phone calls with different organizations, from bids to academic coalitions to trade associations to um, real estate firms, corporate firms to share the all NYC message because what we ultimately want to do from our perspective is restore the confidence and optimism as in New York City as a kind of business place to do business. Uh, if businesses feel comfortable having their firms here and expanding here, uh, they will employ people here. And those folks will become local New Yorkers who will go to the restaurants, go to the, go to the shops, go to uh, Broadway shows and kind of add to the vitality that the city um, you know, is known for. So what that has turned into and what has, has materialized, uh, we, over the past few weeks, have had a, a blitz of activity around all NYC, started off with a bell ringing at the New York Stock Exchange, uh, kind of signifying that the city is, is rebounding back. Uh, we lit up uh, a lot of the skyline last week again to show the city's resiliency uh, and, and desire to kind of come out of this better and stronger. We've had calls with all of these different companies. They are going to their social media channels, sharing the all NYC message. They're drafting op-eds about why their industries. There was a great uh, op-ed piece by the president of Pace uh, University that talks about how New York City will always be the best campus uh, for, for students around the world because 
you know, the kids that go to college and graduate school in New York City are the, are the, the folks who will be founding new businesses, who will be leading the businesses of tomorrow. And we want to remind the world this is still the place to always come and get your education. Uh, where people are creating their own content. They're talking about how their own in industries are all in, why they will never leave. Uh, we're creating content on our own uh, to showcase small businesses and how they're pivoting and recovering. Uh, and we're going to be rolling out, um, you know, a, a small campaign to attract businesses to the city, we're updating all of our materials to uh, kind of shift and pivot our messaging about why the city is the greatest place to do business uh, and making sure that all of the right audiences from site selectors to corporate relocation specialists know that we are ready to, to welcome them and it's still a great, great bet. And then right, as, as- It seems like though, in, in joining in with you with that great vision is the realities of what we're handcuffed with and what we're allowed to do from restrictions placed on a state or federal or administration level versus getting that engine and vision and working with small businesses and hotel occupancy at five to 10% and the venues are closed and permitting processes that are slowed down and quality of life issues that are abound. There is a two different stories that's happening in the city. And what we want to do is listen to the stories today on how we can make a difference by relieving some of the burdens, opening up some of the restrictions and where is EDC's view on transitioning from obviously testing and targeting and what you guys have done better than anyone probably in the world um, and keeping New York City and the amount of testing that was done versus targeting how we can highlight restrictions that are overly onerous, like a 50 person limit ban on a place like Sheridan in Manhattan, a 25% cap on inside eating and restaurants. Um, and my last question for you would also be as the landlord of city property, Jimmy Van Bramer and some of the council members and all of us are saying, we have land that must be used for use of cultural events and for outdoor events, but the process is blocked at almost every step. You are the landlord of those city spaces. What would your vision be to opening up the spaces and getting folks to be outdoors, to get the all in campaign to really encompass all of our city properties, whether from parking lots to parks to streets to any place we can get a performance, a performer to, to go so that folks from Whitestone to Bensonhurst to the Bronx to Manhattan can say, hey, we're going to do this this weekend. That's where we did our all-in video and we did the outdoor um, um, movie night, which was successful and kept the businesses in the, the Bay Terrace complex open for the entire summer. It was something that we did on our own to bring folks in. We need that vision coming from you. Sure, so uh, that, that's a terrific question. Uh, what we've done so far uh, is, is where possible have activated our assets. So at Brooklyn Army Terminal in Sunset Park, we have uh, a drive-in movie theater set up there, uh, which is hosting the New York Film Festival, which is you know a great kind of iconic uh, institution. I think it's the oldest film festival uh, in the city, if not, if not the country. So. Uh, we're making sure to use our assets to bring that sort of program to the city, the program that's allowed, that, that is safe. Uh, we are, are joining with our colleagues uh, in parks and CECM and DCLA, uh, you know, on, on regular phone calls and conversations. And as guidelines are set and as uh, protocols are in place, you know, we are investigating how we can leverage some of our assets. You know, initially our assets were being used for uh, pop-up hospital sites and, and testing facilities. Um, but now we are definitely looking at ways that we can, and we do have a couple kind of uh, irons in the fire um, ideas of how we can leverage our, our space. Uh, some of the space, like Brooklyn Army Terminal, for example, is also an active uh, manufacturing center. So we have to kind of be mindful of not disrupting day to day operations. But something we are focused on, and we are in regular uh, conversations with our other city agency partners uh, on, on, on how we can, can better leverage our space. And we've gotten leads from different city agencies uh, about space we have. So those conversations are happening and something we're definitely focused on. Well, we'd like to hear more on that. And um, I'd like to turn it back to the chair, co-chair Jimmy Van Bramer, if he has any last follow-up questions before we have our uh, committee council swear in the first panel. Um, Jimmy, back to you. Thank you, uh, Chair Vallone. And uh, I know we wanna get to the other panelists in uh, the various industries and sectors being affected. 
so uh, devastatingly. And uh, so I won't uh, prolong it further, just to thank the folks that are here. And once again, implore all of us to not settle for the status quo and uh, to do more better and faster to save more of our cultural organizations. Thank you. <laughs> and conveniently, we've had some success already, uh, Jimmy and everyone here, because the mayor just announced, or the administration just announced, the uh, use for outdoor heating for our dining spaces to streamline the process that was part, a small part of what we're talking about today, to give folks that ability to get through warm weather and, and get the jobs to our folks. So that's good news. So to um, Alex Polinoff, our committee counsel, if we can begin with the panels. And thank you to the uh, admin and those who testified and credit all the great work uh, that you are doing to keep this city the great city it is. Thank you, chairs. We will now turn to public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we will be calling individuals one by one to testify. Each panelist will be given two minutes to speak. Please begin your testimony once the sergeant has started the timer. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the Zoom raise hand function, and we will call on you in the order that you raised your hand after the panelist has completed their testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you, and the sergeant at arms will set the timer and then give you the go ahead to begin. Please wait for the sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Regina Fojas to testify. After Ms. Fojas, uh, Lucy Sexton and Tom Perugia will be following her testimony. Uh, Ms. Fojas, as soon as the sergeant unmutes you, you may begin. Your time starts now. My name is Regina Fojas, Senior Vice President of the Times Square Alliance, speaking on behalf of our president, Tim Tompkins. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you, Councilmember Vallone, for your continued leadership and for, the, and for highlighting the importance of sustaining the tourism industry in a well-coordinated manner. We'd also like to thank NYC and Co for their continued partnership. While, the co while COVID has devastated nearly every industry, tourism has entirely ceased. Times Square, the city's most iconic tourist destination, has borne the brunt of the standstill. The tourism industry is the fourth largest employer in New York City, and we estimate a loss of 35,000 hospitality and service jobs in Times Square so far. Our visitor spending declined by 94%, which is 7% more than citywide, and our average daily pedestrian count plummeted by 90%. These effects will reverberate across all five boroughs. The Alliance proposes a five-point plan for recovery. Number one, establish a dedicated funding stream to NYC and Co. Set a timeline of 24 to 36 months and contribute 50 cents for every dollar of existing hotel occupancy tax revenue to NYC and Co. Also implement NYC and Co's tourism district funding proposal. Number two, tap creatives by putting out an employment grant program to create viral promotional materials under the rubric of All In NYC and give additional tax breaks to TV and film creators who work to create content in line with all in NYC. Number three, address deteriorating public space conditions through an integrated public space management task force. Number four, stop the restaurant apocalypse by implementing New York City Hospitality Alliance's proposals and create a temporary sales tax holiday campaign for people who dine out. And number five, convene a multi-agency tourism relief task force to support NYC and co and solicit all mayoral candidates to issue a long-term tourism recovery plan as part of their platform. I'm expired. A strong New York City, a strong New York City recovery requires strong tourism recovery and strong tourism recovery starts with Times Square. We wanna work with the city to make this happen. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Regina, and give our, our platitudes to Tim, and he was great yeah. this morning as he talked about virtual uh, New Year's Eve celebration this year, and your five-point plan is, as usual, on point, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bohas. Unless there are any additional questions from the members, we will move to the next panelist. Seeing no additional questions, we will move to Lucy Sexton, followed by Thomas Ferrucchia, followed by Candace Thompson Zachary. Ms. Sexton, you may begin your testimony as soon as the sergeant unmutes you. Your time starts now. 
Thank you for allowing me to testify at this important hearing. I want to thank Chair Van Bramer and Majority Leader Cumbo for the bills they've introduced, and I want to thank the speaker for supporting Save Our Stages. Thanks to Chair Vallone also for recognizing culture's role in tourism and the economy. I'm Lucy Sexton from New Yorkers for Culture and Arts, a citywide coalition of cultural groups and workers. We know culture is key to the city's economy. Arts and culture have also led the city out of every crisis in my lifetime, filling empty spaces in the 70s, bringing downtown back after 9-11, and getting tourists back after the financial crisis. We stand ready to lead the recovery again, but with many of our spaces still shuttered and 62% of artists and culture workers still unemployed, we need your help. A story in yesterday's Times, which uh, DCLA commissioner shared on Facebook, uh, talks about the city's survival. It has stories of Zumba classes outside and impromptu music in parks and fire escapes, artists doing chalk murals, people coming together to find joy, beauty, and each other. It's the story of New York City we wanna hear. Yet every day, I hear from theater companies whose long planned shows still don't have permits, who face conflicting restrictions on dance, who can't play music that needs an amp, who can't afford extra cost of permits for events that charge or ask for contributions. I appreciated the DCLA webinar on permitting. It is a complex process with multiple agencies and there are too many obstacles to granting permits. The open restaurants program provided a quick streamlined process to open streets and get sorely needed income to the restaurants. Providing a simple way to open our public spaces to music, dance, theater, visual art and spoken word will transform the city, delivering entertainment and healing and laughter and anger. Thank you, Majority Leader, for your painful opening remarks. There is much anger to be expressed and much change to be demanded. Like struggling restaurants, we must also be allowed to charge for our offerings so that we can pay the artists and workers that make culture happen. Our financial need is urgent. We call for the open culture bills to be expedited so that we can begin to work now. And we can't grow towards financial stability if we can't plan. This open culture program needs to be extended at least through next fall. That'll allow us to plan for performances and exhibitions and fairs for the spring, summer and fall. After winter months indoors, our communities will be longing to get outdoors to celebrate, reflect, and connect. As culture comes out, people will fill the streets, driving traffic to small businesses of every kind. A city filled with vibrant culture and life is exactly what will draw tourists back. Let culture and art work their magic and let our cultural organizations and workers begin to recover economically as we help the city recover. I also want to thank NYC and Co for the work they've been doing, bringing cultural groups and hospitality companies together to form an alliance for New York's recovery. It's been great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lucy. I know Chair Bramer has a question. Yeah, uh, thank you, Lucy, for your uh, testimony and for your advocacy. You mentioned some of the um, difficulties that some of our organizations are having with the current uh, state of affairs with permitting. And I wonder if you could just talk a little bit more about some of the stories you're hearing uh, and, and why exactly the status quo isn't working for, for so many in our community. Uh, for instance, I was just on an email with uh, a theater company that has been planning for months to do a performance in Astor Place. They've been going through all the process. It's a week at now out and they still don't have the permit in hand. Um, it makes it very difficult. I appreciate, I mean, the, the, the webinar was very informative, but what it informed me of was how many different agencies there are and how to navigate that process and that the, those agencies are also navigating different restrictions. You know, this whole question about dance, whether we can dance or not, or yes, we can, but we can't, but it's in the wrong category. So, um, and then amplifying music. Um, someone earlier uh, said something about, um, and you'll hear from other people testifying today, but some, we were talking earlier about whether we can form alliances with restaurants. There is some performing allowed for restaurants, but it's very restricted. <laughs> and then some uh, theaters that are on streets with, uh, that are closed for restaurants can't do anything because they don't wanna interrupt, because they're not allowed to interrupt the restaurants. So it's, uh, it's a lot of restrictions and a lot of obstacles that we're facing. It is not an easy road to getting culture on the streets or you'd be seeing much more of it. That's right. Thank you. I appreciate you just, uh, uh, 
uh, enumerating uh, just what the struggles look like and and the urgency of the moment, right? I think you hear that from me a lot. I hear that from you a lot, right? The urgency of the moment. It's urgent, and I also just want to say that, you know, we have been, you all have been on the calls with us. We are doing deep dives about how to keep things safe. So, you know, I really appreciated what you said, uh, Commissioner Casals, about safety as a first priority. For me, it's absolutely a first priority. The cultural field has been doing deep dives on what's safe, what's not, how can we be with each other, how can we not, because we're concerned about our performers as well. So I think you have a good partner in keeping this safe. It's been so wonderful to find out that, guess what, outdoors is pretty safe. You have to do it right, but um, why, why not be out there? Thank you very much, sorry. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you, Chair Vallone. Thank you. And Lucy, that's exactly right. You know, no one here is saying we're going to do anything that's not safe. And even with the open streets program, we haven't seen any numbers tick up. We are doing safe. New York's got it. We got it from the beginning. So now we need to get it and start moving. And that's why you have this great bill from Jimmy, our great idea to get some additional dedicated staff to streamline this insane process of permits and what's allowed in this new day and age. It's wonderful. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sexton. We'll now be hearing from Thomas Ferugia, followed by Candace Thompson Zachary, followed by DJ Dandapani. Uh, Mr. Ferugia, you may begin your testimony as soon as the sergeant announces the timer. Time starts now. Good afternoon. I'm Thomas Ferugia, Director of Governmental Affairs at the Broadway League. Uh, we want to thank Chairman Von Bramer, Chairman Vallone, and the distinguished members of the committees for allowing us this opportunity to tell our story concerning New York City's tourism industry and the COVID-19 crisis. Um, in addition to its cultural significance, Broadway is a massive economic and tourism driver that until recently brought an average of 40,500 theater goers into Midtown Manhattan every day. Broadway sold 14.8 million tickets in the season ending May of 2019, and 65% of those admissions, or 9.6 million tickets, were made by tourists who live outside New York City and its surrounding suburbs. Most significantly, of those 9.6 million tickets purchased by tourists, an astounding 2.8 million were purchased by visitors from abroad. While we, were, while we are at risk of losing a tremendous number of domestic visitors next year, because of COVID-related dis disincentives to traveling abroad, foreign visitors represent our most at-risk theater goers as the likelihood of their visiting New York City in significant numbers before 2022 is quite low. Last year, we drew audiences from the United Kingdom, Europe, Asia, Australia, Africa, South America, and many other parts of the world, comprising the highest number of foreign visitors in all of Broadway's storied history. Approximately 60% of foreign visitors who attended a show stated that uh, Broadway was one of their most important reasons for visiting New York City. The average foreign Broadway tourist saw an average of 2.3 shows and stayed in the city for an average of 6.7 days. Broadway motivated foreign spending on ancillary activities, not including the purchase price of the theater ticket, exceeded $2.9 billion last year, 2.9 billion. As we know, Broadway, along with every other everything it brings to the economy, ceased on March 14, 2020. And as of today, we still have no clear path to reopening, getting our people back to work, or stimulating those massive tourism dollars for the city. Now to the legislation. New York City and company's marketing efforts that drive business from the tri-state area into the five boroughs is of utmost importance for us as 35% of Broadway theater tickets are purchased by patrons who reside in New York City and the surrounding suburbs. We therefore kindly defer to our friend Fred Dixon and his wonderful team for their opinions on proposed intro 1773A, intro 2034, and intro 2068. Finally, we sincerely appreciate and endorse Chairman Von Bramer's resolution calling on Congress to pass Save Our Stages. As you may know, the Broadway League has been working very closely with the National Independent Venue Association and with Congress in support of SOS. And just this past Friday, September 18th, we joined with Senator Schumer in Times Square for a press conference publicly asking Congress to pass this very bill. Substantial financial support will be required to reopen shuttered shows, launch new productions, and help subsidize losses while this vital industry rebuilds audiences in New York and in the 200 American cities that annually host touring Broadway. Accordingly, we feel it is vital that government recognize the unique cultural, economic, and employment importance of the live commercial theater industry and act to address the devastating impact of the, of the mandated theater closures that they've had on this industry and on our economy. Thank you for this opportunity. 
Thank you, Thomas. And make sure you give Charlotte our love and how we are dying to have you reopened and back and so many things affecting you from the 14 day ban. Name it. Uh, we got to get our artists back on stage. So thank you. For I that. agree. I will do that. And we are here to join with the city as, as soon as we can. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ferugia. A reminder to the panelists who wish to testify today, uh, there's no need to raise your hand. We will have you we we'll call upon you in the order that you uh, submitted testimony. Uh, next up, we will hear from Candice Thompson Zachary, followed by Vijay Dandapani, followed by Charles Shaviro. Ms. Thompson Zachary, you may begin when the sergeants announce the time. Time starts now. Greetings, City Council and committee members, and thank you for having me. I am Candice Thompson Zachary from Dance NYC a service organization which serves over 5,000 individual dancers, 1,200 dance-making entities, and 500 nonprofit dance companies based in New York City. Our diverse constituents include Black, Indigenous, people of color, immigrants, and disabled dance workers. It has been over six months since arts and culture organizations have had to close their doors. Their in-person programming went online, earning a fraction of the typical revenue. Due to lost performance opportunities and the inability to generate enough income to cover basic needs, including housing, food, and healthcare, there is a mass exodus of dancers and artists leaving the city. Live indoor performances may not return for at least a year after a vaccine, and institutions are faltering as we speak. Simultaneously, small business and family-run dance studios are facing closure due to unfair enforcement of the city's vague reopening plans. Our findings show that the dance sector generates 300 million for the city and currently dance projects project losses of at least 22 million in income. The lack of understanding of our sector and the city's failure to include a dance specific representative on the mayor's office advisory committee for arts, culture and tourism has contributed to the dire situation of these key sustainers of the dance workforce, including the DOE, professional training programs and Broadway. Dance NYC is demanding legislation for the quick reopening of more public spaces for revenue generating performance opportunities before winter sets in. The waiving of city permitting fees for arts and culture organizations, outdoor programming, the fees are currently burdensome for arts organizations that are already struggling. Grant funding for the city of, for outdoor public, public space performances to support artists' wages, salaries, and production costs and for the city to provide clear and specific reopening guidelines for the right. dance sector, which are not gyms. Dance NYC strongly advocates for a just and equitable vision for New York City and sustainability for arts and culture, which is necessary for community building, mental health, and drives tourism and the economy. Thank you very much. Keep on dancing, Candice, and everyone else. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Thompson-Zachary. We will next hear from Vijay Dandapani, followed by Charles Shaviro, followed by Christine Nicholas. Mr. Dandapani, you may begin as soon as the sergeant calls time. Time starts now. Good afternoon, Chairs Van Bremer and Malone. Thank you for the opportunity to testify and members of the committee. I'm Vijay Dandapani, President and CEO of the Hotel Association of New York City. We represent 300 hotels in the city, all five boroughs. The impact of COVID-19 has created a really untenable situation for my industry with hotels across the city closing. Approximately 200 hotels have closed, many unsure whether they will ever reopen in the future. Despite these burdens, PANIC, the acronym for Hotel Association, has worked closely with the city on COVID relief efforts, providing hotel space at cost wherever the city needs it, whether for hospital capacity expansion, for homeless individuals in need of additional space, or for healthcare personnel. On a personal note, I have personally led in-person donations of masks, tens of thousands of masks to city hospitals, Flushing and uh, Elmhurst, as well as Mount Sinai, and we will continue to work with the city to uh, address the needs as they arise. As you know, tourism is a crucial economic generator for the city, and hotels are a vital part of this tapestry. But the onset of the uh, pandemic has resulted in a loss of nearly 80% of jobs, of, of which there were 50,000 before COVID hit us. Um, and there was $3.1 billion in taxes that the hotel industry contributed to the city of New York on an annual basis. 
we need support in the industry so that hotels can survive as we represent essential infrastructure funded entirely on private dollars. So create, we support the creation of an Office of Tourism Discovery, uh, Recovery, pardon me, uh, to facilitate tourism's recovery uh, with the caveat that was outlined by Fred Dixon that it not be duplicative. Uh, we hope that they'll use data to come up with good policy options that will enable us a, a quick path forward. Uh, we badly need uh, relief in our industry uh, as we've got none so far from either state, city, or even the federal government. Uh, I just would like to point out that our industry, uh, oh, thank you. Uh, I'll just close by saying that, uh, you know, we would really would like to, like so many others have pointed out, the quarantine aspect to be looked into. There are other policies that could really enable uh, a revisitation of that and then enable tourism to come back to the sea. Thank you for your time. So Vijay, those are some staggering numbers and statistics that affect the entire city. I just want to give you an additional minute there. Um, what is the current occupancy rate? Um, I had heard some numbers of somewhere five to 10%. And, and what do you think that if we could directly do tomorrow to help that impact? Well, thank you, uh, Chair Malone. Uh, the actual occupancy rate is under 10%, closer to 8%. The nominal rate that's being put out is about 38% or thereabouts. Uh, that's a misleading number because you've got several hotels, close to 35, 40% of hotels that are not reporting. As I said, 200 hotels have closed. And on top of it, you've got uh, many hotels that are now catering to government business. And we are thankful for that, of course. So that misleads the true tourism number. It's really between seven and 8%. And in terms of your question, but what? And if that continues, what, what, how many hotels will be able to survive? Well, we, we are estimating between 25 and 30% of hotels will simply go out of business. They had a liquidity problem and now it's fast becoming a solvency problem. And as I said earlier, it's an infrastructure issue and we're gonna see whenever tourism does come back and we're all very confident and bullish on New York, but when it comes back, it takes three years to do a greenfield hotel project. Uh, so we're gonna lose essential infrastructure and jobs, of course. And then the last part to that was, what can we do tomorrow to, to start this process? To get, well, get in? I, I mean, it's something that I think all of us here can easily endorse, which is a, a more, shall we say, um, enlightened, if you will, policy with regard to the quarantine. Uh, as you know, it's well known, imitation is the best form of flattery. There are other jurisdictions that are doing this uh, and are doing it successfully, Maine notably, but also Alaska, Hawaii, and the entire Caribbean, they're doing an RT-PCR test that is not 100% sure, but is close to 99% sure that when somebody's negative, they're good to go. Whereas a quarantine is an absolute curtain wall that prevents people from coming into the city. And, uh, and it's really is what killed any sign of a pulse that we started to see in July with regard to occupancy. Thank you, BJ, and we will continue to work immediately together with all of this, as we always do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dandapani. We will next hear from Charles Shaviro, followed by Christine Nicholas, followed by Amy Roth. Mr. Shaviro, you may begin as soon as the sergeant's call time. Time starts now. Good morning. My name is Charles Shaviro. I'm the data researcher at the Center for an Urban and Future, an independent think tank focused on expanding economic opportunity in New York City. I'll be sharing testimony prepared for today's hearing by our policy director, Eli DeVorkin. Thank you for the opportunity. Our research at the center has shown just how important tourism has become as a source of middle income and accessible jobs for New Yorkers across the five boroughs. Prior to the pandemic, 91% of the jobs in tourism were accessible to New Yorkers without a bachelor's degree. And although most of these jobs are concentrated in Manhattan, the tourism workforce is distributed across the entire city. For example, 81% of hotel workers live in the four boroughs outside Manhattan, where dollars earned in the tourism sector have a significant local impact. Given how important tourism has become to the city's economy, the city will need to do more to help lay the groundwork for a long-term recovery. To start, NYC and company will have to build on and expand the promising all-in NYC campaign and take the city's local and regional marketing efforts to the next level. And it will require support from the city council to do so. For instance, the council and the mayor's office should work together on a new discount and incentive program designed to turn out New Yorkers to become tourists in their own city. The city can draw inspiration from Montreal's Passport Attractions Program, 
which is spurring locals to visit tourist attractions, or the UK's Eat Out to Help Out scheme, which provided a government-backed 50% discount for dining out at local restaurants on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday nights in August. The council can build on the effective Open Streets for Restaurants initiative by expanding this free online permitting system to work for cultural organizations and performance venues of all sizes, an approach that could help these hard hit venues generate much needed revenue while serving as an attractor to boost visitation in commercial hubs like Midtown. The council could also direct the creation of a new initiative enlisting New York City's creatives to promote the city. This Works Progress Administration style program could hire out of work artists and creatives to respond to all in NYC brief. To wrap up these efforts, NYC and company will need a new level of support to broadcast New York City's public health success story. The mayor and city council should increase baseline funding for NYC and company and work with the state to pilot that a consistent stream of future revenues is dedicating a small portion of taxes from hotel and other accommodation states to fund tourism marketing promotion. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today and for bringing attention to this vital part of the city's overall recovery strategy. Thank you, Charles. And that also is a good point for any of the panelists you know, to please submit testimony to. So for anyone who asks after the hearing what your thoughts and points were, we can make sure we can distribute that to anyone who's asking. Um, and yes, we agree with you on the budget especially after eight years of no increases to New York and company. And now with the budget crisis, uh, all the great work they do is, is jeopardized by this budget. So we have to increase these resources. So thank you, Charles. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shabiro. We will next hear from Christine Nicholas, followed by Amy Roth, and then Siri Horvitz. Uh, Ms. Nicholas, you may begin your testimony as soon as the Sergeant calls time. Time starts now. Chairs Malone, Van Bremer, and members of the City Council, thank you for your focus on tourism, one of the most important economic drivers of New York City and critical to our recovery. My name is Christine Nicholas. I'm the chair of the Broadway Association. I chair the Gov Governor, Tour Governor Cuomo's Tourism Advisory Council, and I'm the former CEO of NYC and Company, which during 9-11, I was honored to help create the roadmap to tourism's recovery. And I was honored to promote to the world just how resilient New York City is. This global pandemic is challenging our resilience. We need to think outside the box. And I thank the city council for your creative thinking and offer my support for these bills today. Regarding intro 1773A, which would establish an office of tourism recovery within the office of the mayor, I see the need for executive level coordinated approach from city hall to rebuild tourism economy in this historic time of need. I am aware also of the budget crisis and know that investing in new personnel during this time would be challenging and probably not necessary. As done in New York State, the state ESD hosts a quarterly interagency tourism task force pooling resources and assigning existing state employees to be responsible and accountable for tourism policy. The city personnel is there. They just need to be directed. However, I still urge the administration to fully invest in NYC and company's future. According to the Center of Urban Future, uh, New York, NYC and Company's overall tourism budget has not stayed competitive with other global destinations. Tourism is a revenue generator for NYC, and we need now more than ever to generate revenue for our city. I applaud NYC and Company for their outstanding work, and I also know that this office would be very important to coordinate the agencies, as we have done in the past with big events such as the NBA All-Star Game, World Economic Forum, the Grammys, and others. A current and immediate tourism recovery that the city council and the city can do today is to support the meetings and events businesses throughout the five boroughs, a $10 billion industry that is completely closed. Powerful meetings and events industry would have a massive economic impact to our restaurants, retail, and small businesses that are the backbone of our economy. According to NYC and Company's 2019 report, $46 billion in visitor spending supported almost 400,000 jobs citywide and generated $70 billion in economic activity. Sadly, however, the tourism industry is now one of the slowest to recover. If we fail tourism, we fail us all. I commend the City Council for your hard work on these bills and thank you for your attention to tourism, New York City's fourth largest industry. Thank you. Christine, your, your experience and words are needed more than ever. So thank you for today and always helping us guide our way through. Um, and I know you've worked with numerous administrations and have many titles. If there, was, if there was a single focus that you could say, if we started tomorrow, that would make the most difference, what, what, what would that be? The meetings and events industry, some of your other speakers have mentioned it. 
they're ready to go. They are professionals and understand how um, this arbitrary number of 50 individuals is just, um, it's not realistic. When you look at the ballrooms and the hotels and you look at the wide open spaces that many of the big event um, spaces have, you can divide that up. You can spread out hundreds and hundreds of people. And other states now are using our weakness as their, to their advantage and welcoming other uh, conventions, small meetings, weddings, and we're losing out. Thank you. And that's a perfect something that can be done tomorrow. And that's why it's so important. I thank you for, but I like all the panelists making it through now into our third hour for waiting to be heard because I'm hoping folks are listening. And, and I know thank I you for your leadership. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Nicholas. We will next hear from Amy Roth, followed by Siri Horvitz and then Drew Chopra. Ms. Roth, you may begin as soon as the sergeant calls time. Time starts now. Good afternoon. I'm Amy Roth, COO of the Whitney Museum of American Art. Thank you for hosting this hearing and inviting the cultural community to speak. The Whitney is a contemporary art museum focused on the art of the United States and located in lower Manhattan. The Whitney at its core is a New York City institution. About 80% of our staff live within the city and New Yorkers account for more than a third of our annual average visitation of 1 million. The impact of the pandemic is unprecedented on the Whitney. Revenue losses are significant. We rely on revenue from ticket sales and visitor related revenue, which is about one third of our $60 million annual operating budget. The Whitney is committed to contributing to the city's recovery. Last April, we convened 25 museums from across the five boroughs to establish the New York City Museum's reopening task force. The task force developed a set of reopening protocols with the belief that standardized procedures will contribute to the health, safety, and confidence in visiting museums across New York City. The Whitney's own reopening plans aim to welcome back New Yorkers. Engaging and expanding this audience is vital for reaching our attendance and admissions goals. The Whitney enthusiastically supports NYC and company's efforts to encourage hyperlocal tourism and rebuild New York City's tourism economy. The Whitney reopened to the public on September 3rd, and as a gesture to the city, Admission during the month of September is pay what you wish. We've seen a very strong response from New Yorkers. The Whitney is planning for the gradual but certain full recovery of tourism to New York. Pre-COVID, tourists accounted for nearly 60% of the museum's paid visitation. Looking ahead, increasing revenue from admissions is essential. It's critical that New Yorkers patronize museums and cultural organizations. The support of the City of New York and NYC and Company to continue promoting the cultural community is vital and any further investment in public awareness and facilitating pathways for New Yorkers to visit the city's museums would be greatly appreciated. The Whitney's unwavering in its commitment to serve the city of New York and remains grateful for the ongoing support it received from the New York City Council. Thank you all. Thank you, Amy. Um, and uh, I look forward to returning to the Whitney uh, myself. Um, what, what are your numbers uh, looking like? Obviously you've got uh, uh, a month plus of experience under your belt. Um, how many folks have gone through per day totals? What does that look like? What's the experience look like? Yes, thank you. We are capped, as you know, at 25%. So we started a, a little bit more conservatively at 20% um, tickets uh, offered to the public. Advanced booking is required. And uh, we have seen about 30 to 40 percent um, attrition. So uh, really uh, reduced numbers in terms of what a normal uh, uh, season would look like. Um, for us, that's about uh, anywhere between 600 and 1,000 visitors a day. So again, that is significantly reduced. Um, we're just four weeks in. Um, we are pay what you wish. So when we go back to full price uh, program, uh, we expect to see some of that attrition um, go, go down. But, uh, you know, it's, it's really um, slow going, but the robustness has come from, uh, from New Yorkers. Thanks so much to the efforts of uh, everyone here on, uh, on the committees and New York City and company. Right. While it's uh, down greatly, it's uh, still good to hear that 600 to 1,000 people are uh, going through uh, your 
a very large and very beautiful uh, museum. And uh, again, look forward to, uh, to getting back there myself. Um, back to the committee council. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Ms. Roth, for your testimony. Uh, next, we will hear from Siri Horvitz, followed by Dhruv Chopra, followed by Duke Dang. Uh, Ms. Horvitz, you may begin your testimony as soon as the sergeant's called. I'm starts now. Chair Van Bremer, Chair Ballone, and members of the committees, my name is Siri Horvitz, and I'm the Director of Government and Community Relations for Lincoln Center for the Performing Arts, a member of the Cultural Institutions Group. I express my gratitude to the chair and to Majority Leader Cumbo for recognizing the significant challenges faced by the city's performing arts organizations, which continue to remain closed due to COVID-19. Lincoln Center supports the proposed intros 2068 and 2034, which if passed will help us restart our programming and resume our sizable contribution to the city's position as the world's cultural capital. In the absence of our indoor venues, performing arts organizations are desperate for alternative spaces in which to present programming. Access to outdoor space is critical for our long-term survival. Bringing culture to the city's outdoor spaces affords many benefits. It will restart our organization's revenue streams, spur job creation for artists and arts workers, drive economic impact for tourism-related businesses, and help audiences ease back into the comfort of attending performances. Lincoln Center's 16-acre campus is resplendent with ample open spaces begging for creative use making us uniquely positioned to offer our spaces to our peers all across the five boroughs in the absence of their home venues. However, the process of navigating the city's many oversight arms to date have been cumbersome despite best efforts. We can't even program our own spaces. The proposed legislation would bypass these barriers, allowing us to self-certify our socially distant programming and apply for free permits by an expedited online process. This would ease our organization's bandwidth burden and reduce the city's reliance on precious staff resources during an already challenging period in our history. Lincoln Center urges the city council to swiftly pass intros 2068 and 2034. The performing arts are a significant part of the reason why local and non-local tourists visit New York City. We share the city's safety concerns and stand ready with detailed health protocols to safeguard our artists, employees, and audiences. We are confident that we can work with the city to mitigate health risks, provide positive community impact, and achieve wonderful results for the city's residents and visitors alike. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Syrian. Um, it is uh, great to have, um, you know, Lucy and so many of our uh, small um, uh, not-for-profit, out-of-borough, BIPOC-led cultural organizations um, uh, calling for this, but also good to have uh, Lincoln Center um, uh, throwing your weight behind this as well, because you are uh, incredibly important to our city and you amplify the voices of all of those other organizations, right? All of those other uh, cultural organizations that have budgets of 100,000 or 200,000, right? And, and so um, as you were speaking and talking about how uh, both my bill and, and majority leader Cumbo's bills would be helpful to Lincoln Center. What I kept thinking is you're, you're amplifying the voices of those who are uh, much smaller. And, and I'm just really glad that Lincoln Center is here to do that. So thank you. Thank you, Chair. We're doing our best. We would love to be able to offer our spaces to organizations all across the city. This is not just for Lincoln Center's benefit. Now That's is the right. time where we need to be a better civic actor and a community partner. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Horvitz. We will next hear from Dhruv Chopra, followed by Duke Dang, followed by Lizzie Marmon. Mr. Chopra, you may begin as soon as the sergeant's call time. Time starts now. Mr. Chopra, we can't hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Apologies, I wanted to say thank you for everybody for the concern that you're taking in the industry. It's been really heartwarming to hear uh, all the things in motion. And of course we do need to do more. I think the 
uh, issues concerning the broader industry and its impact in the city have been well outlined. So perhaps I can focus on our individual experience at Elsewhere, which is a BIPOC uh, music venue, uh, music and arts venue focused on emerging music in Bushwick. Uh, we have multiple rooms catering to artists uh, just starting off their career who can bring in maybe 50 or 100 people in a small room, local artists, as well as international touring artists who can fill, uh, let's say, two or 3,000 people in the room. Elsewhere's capacity all in is about 1,600. And we're also the owners and operators of Popcorn Presents, which is a, a citywide booking and promotion company that's been around for 12 years, again, with a focus on emerging music without boundaries. And for us, uh, this is obviously culturally devastating because new artists aren't given a chance to share their voices and their art with the world, uh, but also because, you know, our staff of over 100 has now dwindled to about, uh, you know, a skeleton crew of about five people. We have a small outdoor space, which is giving us a little bit of uh, uh, activity. But at the end of the day, the real point I want to make is that without federal funding, uh, most if not all independent music venues will be going away if we're not already sort of underwater and, and walking ghosts. You know, we at Elsewhere are in a favorable position because we had a small profit last year that's been reinvested this year and we have an understanding landlord and we were able to renegotiate uh, insurance, but those offsets are obviously not down to zero, which is basically what our activity is down to. And as a result, uh, with PPP money running out uh, and events getting canceled for which we have to return tickets, most of us are already underwater and will be, you know, evicted, if not just going into bankruptcy by the end of the year. And when we're looking at a thank you, all it says, if we're looking at uh, probably another one or two years for shutdown, uh, we're concerned that obviously this is not something we're prepared for as an independent industry. Thank you for that. And we need to hear those stories. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chopra. We will next hear from Duke Dang, followed by Lizzie Marmon, followed by Dale Thacker. Mr. Dang, you may begin when the sergeant's call time. Time starts now. My name is Duke Dang. I'm the general manager of Works Hand Process, the resident performing arts organization at the Guggenheim Museum. For 17 years, I've produced over 500 performances at the museum, many in its iconic rotunda, arguably one of the most indoor social distance conducive spaces in the city. The performing arts grow the economy, tourism and employment, yet with theaters closed, the industry is homeless. The Guggenheim Rotunda can play a role when museums are allowed to produce performances indoors, but we need greater capacity and more imaginative space use to deploy the performing arts to amplify New York's recovery. Having produced many performances in the Rotunda and currently right now producing NBA like dance bubbles, in isolation in the Hudson Valley, I'd like to share and propose a simple idea that in one gesture can grow tourism, create jobs and help satisfy audience demand. The idea is indoor hotel atrium performances right now or this winter. Deemed essential throughout the pandemic, hotels have experienced low occupancy and room rates. And similar to the Guggenheim Rotunda, the Marriott Marquis, the Conrad Downtown, the Roxy, the Beekman Hotels, all have indoor atriums. Having produced Guggenheim Rotunda performances this winter, I think performances in hotel atriums can be coveted amenities for hotel guests watching safely from their room balconies. No tickets are sold, non-cancelable room reservations are made, only registered ho hotel guests are permitted, check-ins are spaced out, elevators are keyed to assigned floors, room service can be available, this elegant solution optimizing the innate social distancing created by indoor atrium spaces and hotel operations could allow artists and fans to safely gather and performance, dining and lodging can all come together to rebuild New York. Thank you for your time. Duke, that could be the idea of the day. Thank you so much. That is a great idea. And I think we'll probably wind up submitting Jimmy and I that idea immediate for, for conversation and legislation today. Thank you very much. It's the first time I presented it. So um, <laughs> first time I've provided testimony. So keep it coming. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Dang. We will next hear from Lizzie Marmon, followed by Gail Thacker, followed by Mallory Markham. Ms. Marmon, you may begin as soon as the sergeant's call time. Time starts now. 
Good afternoon. My name is Lizzie Marmon. My pronouns are they, them, theirs, and I'm the manager of institutional giving at the Museum of the City of New York, one of the 34 members of the CIG. Thank you, Chair Van Bramer and Chair Vallone and members of the committees for this opportunity to offer testimony on the impact of the COVID-19 crisis on the city's tourism industry and to share the museum's experience since reopening. Prior to COVID-19, the museum serves 300,000 visitors annually, with 40% from the New York City metro area, including 50,000 students and educators, and the remaining 60% of our visitors are tourists, 30% domestic, 30% international origin. Throughout the pandemic, the museum has served as a steadfast resource on our city's past, present, and future, virtually, and now as of August 27th, once again, on site. The museum has welcomed nearly 3,000 visitors since reopening, in addition to 25,000 served through virtual programming during the same period, none of which would have been possible without the hard work and commitment of my colleagues. Past audience research has shown that visitors see the museum as a place of comfort, escape, and exploration. 50% of our visitors since reopening had not been to the museum before, and most of those who are visiting are staying for longer. However, challenges remain. For FY21, the museum cut its budget by 30% through significant reductions in personnel and programming. Since reopening, the museum has rehired and increased hours for some staff, though 20% of full-time staff remain on reduced hours. Attendance is a 75% reduction from the same period last year. Earned income is down, but we are encouraged by increased purchases per capita in our shop and that our cafe will reopen with the start of indoor dining. In the short term, we expect the majority of our visitors will be from our East Harlem neighborhood and from Manhattan, but in accordance with city and state guidance, we hope to safely welcome visitors from across the five boroughs, from drive-in markets in the Northeast and beyond. New York City's economic prosperity is synonymous with culture. It drives our spending, for many it's our livelihood, and the city's cultural offerings serve as a beacon for global visitors. Culture will be a critical component of the city's recovery, and the Museum of the City of New York is a committed partner in this transformed cultural landscape. Thank you. Thank you, Lizzie. We love our museum. Us too. Thank you, Lizzie Marmon. Uh, next, we will hear from Gail Thacker, followed by Olympia Cosby, followed by Amy Todorov. Ms. Thacker, you may begin as soon as the sergeant's call time. Your time starts now. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Gail Thacker. I am the artistic director of the Gene Frankel Theater, which is on Bond Street between Lafayette and Bowery. We are an open street, and I'm here to tell you my story about this. Um, first, I want to thank everyone. Um, it's really great to see everybody's face, and I know it's been difficult, but here we are. Um, the work that has come from this venue for 71 years has been has had civil rights and progressive thinking at its core. Today, this is more relevant and necessary than ever. We need our voices to be heard. We have been closed for almost seven months now. During that time, especially in the beginning, when we, in, we, we were gone, ho, going forward, purchasing HVAC systems with the M13 filters, fixing up cleaning stations with hand sterilizers, touchless thermometers, safety templates, following all the directions and guidelines on New York Forward. Painted, cleaned, removed our fixed seats, and we wait, and we wait. And as we wait, we have emptied our savings accounts. We fundraise, we fundraise. We need you to see that we are not like Broadway. We are small theaters. We are flexible. We can have a checkerboard system for seating, and we can do this safely. So as we've watched the restaurants and bars thriving outdoors with food and entertainment, we've tried to apply for the same permits, but we've run into brick walls. So I said, well, I can't bring them in, I'll bring it to them. So I built a stage at the window, we have a storefront window. It's a small little stage for probably one, maybe two persons. And I applied for more permits to have outdoor seatings. But be, okay, but because the street is closed, we cannot. Um, I just ask you to please um, help us move forward in this area. Thank you. I have more to read, but I'll stop. Thanks. Thank you, Gail. We want to see that show on that stage. Yeah, I just want to uh, uh, share Valone. Uh, say thank you uh, to Gail and uh, say how heartbreaking 
uh, your story is uh, because of all that you've done to make reform as possible, you actually have the capability to do something and, and yet you're stymied and prevented uh, from doing so. And that's exactly what we need to stop doing in this city uh, and, and give you the ability to get back out there. Uh, and, and so, you know, that's how I started this hearing and how I'll end it, that the city has to do more and better and quicker and, and not accept the status quo that, we're, that we have a permitting system, it works, we're doing okay. You know, we're, we're gonna lose too many uh, small theater companies, small performance companies, uh, small cultural organizations uh, that, 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 you know, in that glorious day, whenever it's one or two years from now, when, when we're all dancing in the streets again, there'll be too many people who won't be left operating. Um, we cannot wait until then. So um, that story was particularly painful, but, but I thank you for sharing it. Thank you, Ms. Thacker. Uh, we will next hear from Olympia, Olympia Kazi, followed by Amy Todorov, and then Kimberly Olson. Ms. Kazi, you may begin as soon as the sergeant's call time. Well, sorry, sorry to disappoint, but I'm not Olympia Kazi. My name, I'm representing um, the Music Workers Alliance um, on, on behalf of my fellow executive board member, Olympia Kazi. My name is Mark Rebo, M-A-R-C, R-I-B-O-T. I'm formerly a working musician, um, over 300 CD credits and touring internationally, both with my own projects and as a side musician. Um, I'm a member of Local 802, former, uh, former chair of the, for, former president of the Content Creators Coalition and former chair of, of the Indie Musicians Caucus of Local 802. Um, I'm here to speak very strongly in favor of the bills presented by um, uh, uh, Council uh, Majority Leader uh, Combo and uh, James Van Bramer. I think these are both essential, street, speak very strongly in support of Save Our Stages, also essential. Um, I wanna note that in today's discussion, uh, you know, there, of drawing tours back to New York, there has been a presumption that when this is over, there's New York City is going to be a world-class cultural center that is capable for which, to which tourists can return. That is not a presumption that I think people should be making. Since the beginning of the COVID crisis, Music Workers Alliance has been holding dozens of open meetings for indie musicians and DJs at all levels, people have shown up from the most grassroots to really accomplished, um, to highly accomplished uh, known professionals. And we, I, I just have to tell you, people are desperate. We have been shut down in every way, um, in I'm every sorry. way. Okay, we've been shut down in every way imaginable. Um, our gigs have been shut down. We're unable to travel abroad where as opportunities arise there. Um, so yes, well, what we would like, what we would like to see is this uh, bill as the beginning of a creative discussion on reopening. These bills by themselves are not sufficient, but we need the city to, to begin this process by passing these bills we understand the financial situation, but the use of non-financial resources, the advocacy for the state and federal levels, where the irony of our situation is that while we're shut down and losing support, um, digital uh, online digital platforms are making billions of dollars off in the often copyright infringing use of our work. Um, we're, we're looking forward to a rezo um, towards creating economic justice in the digital domain. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark, for your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Rebo. We will next hear from Amy Todorov, followed by Kimberly Olson, and then Adam Ganser. Ms. Todorov, you may begin as soon as the sergeant's call time. Time starts now. 
Hi, I'm Amy Todorov, Director of the League of Independent Theater. So things we know, culture beautifies community space, it unifies neighborhoods, and it revitalizes economies. We need all three as we face the future of New York City with an uncertain budget. Allowing artists to activate public spaces creates an unofficial city workforce of caretakers that will maintain these public spaces and stimulate spending in the neighborhood-based mom and pop shops that we know multiply financial impact. The legendary theater director, Peter Sellers, credits the city of Los Angeles' decision to host an outdoor performance festival in the early 1990s with turning around the fortunes of their downtown corridor and parks. New York artists can do the same for our city in the months and years to come, but only if you can provide a fast-tracked and streamlined way to let artists have access to their public spaces through one point of contact. The open culture plan proposed by Councilmember Van Bramer and Councilmember Cumbo is a great start. Why is the delightful paint and pour that is on my block allowed to operate a sidewalk painting class through open streets, but cultural nonprofits are prohibited? because we don't serve wine and appetizers, culture does not require mask removal. Our artists can't lose another year's worth of opportunity. Outdoor performance and culture needs to be enshrined through at least the end of 2021. We all understand that tourism is driven by culture, but respectfully to the great work that you are all doing, this isn't about tourists. Access to art is a right. Through a fast-tracked permit, an easily accessible app to find public space, and a single point of contact, New York City needs a simplified system for performance in outdoor public spaces that prioritizes local, independent, nonprofit performance arts and cultural groups that understand the needs of their community, especially those that are BIPOC, immigrant, or LGBTQ. Thank you. Thank you. I just uh, want to once again give uh, credit to the League of Independent Theaters. You all do amazing work. And uh, it was um, uh, our Zoom meeting from several months ago uh, that helped uh, produce the piece of legislation that I introduced. Uh, and so I want to thank you for your advocacy and that fierce testimony. Thank you, Ms. Todorov. We will now hear from Kimberly Olson, followed by Adam Dancer and then Lynn Kelly. Ms. Olson, you may begin as soon as the sergeant's call time. Time starts now. Thank you for the opportunity to testify and council member Cumbo and council member Van Bramer for your leadership and commitment to arts and arts education. My name is Kimberly Olson and I come to you today as the executive director of the New York City Arts and Education Roundtable and as a proud District 26 resident. On behalf of the Roundtable's membership, I'm here to highlight the importance of continuing existing partnerships between New York City's cultural arts organizations and our public schools to support the financial sustainability of our cultural community. The New York City Arts and Education Roundtable is a service organization who builds its efforts around the values that arts are essential and that arts education is a right for all New York City students. We represent over 120 cultural organizations and 2,000 teaching artists in every discipline. These creative thinkers quit quickly pivoted in the spring and summer to partnering with educators on curriculum, delivering art supplies to families, and creating engaging videos to promote art making at home and in our communities. Over 310 arts organizations partner with public schools each year. These organizations hope to continue these arts learning opportunities to support the city's recovery process, despite the financial hardships and burdens they now face due to COVID-19. These partnerships employ thousands of artists, give students space to promise process trauma and think critically about the world around them and help students build important life skills that will help them move beyond the pandemic. Going into this unprecedented school year, we understand the dynamics of both remote and in-school learning will be tested and adjusted throughout the year. However, the critical services that our cultural community provides has proven to be an uplifting creative outlet for our students, it supports our DOE's goals of equity and excellence for all, and again, provides these critical employment opportunities, especially for arts education organizations who collectively reported artistic employment decreases of over 2,100 artists or 78% of their artist staffing as of May 8th. Given the importance of these partnerships in filling the gap in arts instruction, we request City Council's help in preventing schools from eliminating arts education in order to make up for budget shortfall. Thank you so much for your time and consideration. 
Thank you, Kimberly. And boy, do we love District 26. So well, you know, uh, Councilmember Ballone, some would say District 26 is the best district uh, in the city to live in. But, you much argument there. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you, Kimberly. Um, as you know, I'm a huge believer in, in arts and education, and uh, we absolutely cannot sacrifice that at this particular moment in time. Um, you know, people think these are the times where we can cut back on the arts, uh, arts and education in particular, but we actually have to double down um, if we're ever truly going to recover. So thank you for the work that you do in this field. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Ms. Olson. We'll next hear from Adam Ganser, followed by Lynn Kelly, and then Susan Donahue. Mr. Ganser, you may begin as soon as the sergeant's call time. Time starts now. Thank you. I'm Lucy Robson from New York Parks, testifying on behalf of Adam Ganser, our executive director. Uh, thank you to Chairs Vallone and Van Bramer for giving us the opportunity to speak about this issue. Um, I think it's no surprise to anyone on this call that this summer parks have been in demand like never before. New Yorkers for Parks is the only independent advocacy organization for parks in New York City. We advocate for the tools and resources that allow stewards of these public spaces to keep them clean, safe, and welcoming for all New Yorkers. We are thrilled to see New Yorkers coming together for community, for recreation, and yes, for culture and art in our parks and open spaces. At the same time, we need to be mindful that the demand we create not outstrip the ability of park stewards to care for the public spaces with the resources that are available. Volunteers can't band together the way they normally do to pick up litter and care for plants. The nonprofits and conservancies that organize volunteer and pay for additional maintenance and repairs are suffering because their own ability to fundraise has been cut out from under them. And New York City Parks, the agency that oversees 14% of the city's land, got handed a budget cut of 14% in June, just as demand was soaring towards a summer peak. And we hear that additional layoffs may be on the table that might cut down parks labor again, making maintenance even more difficult. These cuts that were handed down in June mean fewer full-time staff and over 1,700 fewer seasonal staff to do day-to-day -day maintenance. And that was with a coalition of over 300 organizations called Play Fair that we organized to advocate for park maintenance and park resources. So I'd like to draw your attention to this imbalance between the many jobs we are asking our parks to do for us and the maintenance jobs that have been removed. If the council provides a pathway for cultural organizations to use our public parkland and our public realm, we must ensure that the stewards of that public realm are not overlooked. Not Expanding park usage cannot be an unfended mandate. So to be brief, we encourage the use of our parks and our public spaces for arts and culture, and we need to ensure that we have a conversation about directing resources to the entities that are taking care of them. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Robson. We will next hear from Lynn Kelly, followed by Mallory Markham, followed by Heather Lubov. Ms. Kelly, you may begin as soon as it starts this call time. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Tara Gitter on behalf of Lynn Kelly, Executive Director of New York Restoration Projects, and I thank you for the opportunity to testify today. New York Restoration Project, the only citywide natural land conservancy, owns and operates 52 community gardens and stewards over 80 acres of city park land, many of them in our least green neighborhoods. Each year, our parks and gardens host thousands of neighbors for jazz festivals, performing arts displays, installations by local artists, concerts, and more. This year has put on display the importance of New York City's parks and open spaces as a crucial resource for maintaining physical and mental health, community connectivity, resource sharing, and more. We're excited for the prospect of connection, excuse me, connecting cultural assets to public spaces. And the arts are an essential piece of New York and will be a part of the economic, physical, and psychological revival of the city. It's important though to remember how we watched our city's parks struggle to handle the burden of increased use equipped with decreased staff and funding. With a 14% budget cut to New York City parks and limited fundraising impairing the nonprofit organizations who fill in gaps and support our open spaces, our city has suffered. The situation is untenable, and without adequate support, we risk our parks and gardens and their ability to serve New York. 
We ask that the city and state work together and with open space partners to implement processes that will permit cultural organizations and programming to reasonably occupy space and parks, while also considering the resources needed to maintain safety and access for all. Maintenance needs are huge, and legislation should ensure that partners utilizing parkland are not adding to the already overburdened park staff. As open space operators, we want to be sure that cultural organizations can use parkland and that the systems for approval remain simple and accessible. Parks operates a straightforward permitting process which organizes space access and minimizes potential conflict. We want to thank council members for supporting parks and gardens and for recognizing the benefit of bringing cultural offerings outdoors. We hope the needs of New Yorkers will be acknowledged in both increased access to programming and in the support of public lands that require maintenance to serve New Yorkers now more than ever. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Chair Valone, I just wanna uh, uh, respond um, because I hear you know some concerns from advocates for parks, but uh, you know we don't have to pit one against the other. And uh, I, I think there are those of us who are incredibly supportive of, of parks uh, and uh, I voted against uh, the budget, uh, for example, um, it, that we voted on just past June um, for many reasons. But um, I just wanna say, hey, I believe that the cultural organizations that uh, desperately need access to the parks have themselves uh, talked about uh, the fact that they would be liable for cleaning up um, uh, and, and wrapping up after their performances, uh, being good stewards and not contributing in any way to uh, any uh, undue burden on, on the parks uh, system uh, and the green spaces that we all have and wanna keep uh, as beautiful as they are. So. You know, I think that there's actually uh, a confluence of interests here, uh, not um, uh, a divergence. And just want to say that because I know that uh, parks have been cut. That's real. Uh, parks are being utilized more than ever in the pandemic. Uh, and that's both good and real. Uh, but I also want to stress that the cultural community is talking about these issues already. And, and, and seeking to address them and will amend the legislation uh, to include uh, that. But um, uh, the cultural community stands ready, willing and able to meet the challenge of both having greater access to these spaces and then being good stewards of them and leaving them uh, cleaner than they met them. Uh, well said, Chair Van Bramer, because that, that is a partnership for the future here and during this new crisis. And I think we will make that divide into one uh, as we look for outdoor spaces and support both parks and cultural events. Uh, and that puts a greater reliability on our offices and our budgets and coordinating with community groups and civic groups and sanitation groups and students to get out to the parks and clean and participate and it would be a win-win so we can get it done. Thank you, Ms. Kelly. Next up is Mallory Markham, followed by Heather Lubov, and then Ann Wilson. Ms. Markham, you may begin as soon as the sergeant's call time. Time starts now. Hello, members of the Committee on Economic Development and the Committee on Cultural Affairs. My name is Mallory Markham. I am an independent dance performer and administrator for New York-based contemporary dance company, Eric Taylor Dance. I am sharing testimony today on behalf of Eric Taylor Dance in support of intro 2068. Established in 2006, Eric Taylor Dance is a nonprofit dance company whose mission is to create community by connecting through movement. Eric Taylor Dance presents original performances, conducts master classes, makes grants for aspiring choreographers, and curates community city programs in support of housing sites across all five boroughs. Like most organizations, Eric Taylor Dance was forced to radically shift course when the pandemic hit. Our company's income was cut in half overnight as the result of canceled workshops, performances, rehearsals, and guest artist engagements. Our latest choreographic venture, Uncharted Territory, was conceived in collaboration with our dancers and developed over Zoom. Going virtual was crucial in order to keep the company operational, but virtual means are limiting and unsustainable, especially for performing arts. Uncharted Territory is planned to make its outdoor premiere in New York City on March 21st of 2021 with a week of live and virtual events throughout multiple public sites across New York City. 
Intro 2068 with an extension through next summer is crucial to the actualization of our project and the survival of our company. According to data released by the National Endowment for the Arts in 2018, the performing arts sector accounts for $760 billion of the national GDP. $114.4 billion of that is from New York State alone. The performing arts industry has been significantly impacted both economically and culturally due to extended closures and regulations with little opportunity to resume our business. This bill would usher in a new opportunity for us to set for our sector to rebuild. Art not only stimulates our economy, but allows us to feel human. That's why it's so essential that we pass this legislation. Thank you for your time and for giving Eric Taylor Dance the opportunity to bring our story forward. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Markham. Next, we will hear from Heather Lubov, followed by Ann Wilson, and then Sawaki Komatsu. Ms. Lubov, you may begin as soon as the sergeant's call time. Time starts now. Hi, I'm Heather Lubov, Executive Director of City Parks Foundation, which provides free programs to encourage New Yorkers to use and care for their neighborhood parks. We are both a cultural and a parks organization, so we have a unique perspective on outdoor performance. Every year we present 180 free performances in roughly 100 parks around the city, reaching 185,000 people both through Summer Stage, which is New York's largest free outdoor performing arts festival, and our traveling public mobile. Parks have been critical to the well-being of our city, as we all know, and the arts are equally vital to our spirits and to tourism. Nobody is a greater advocate for outdoor performance than City Parks Foundation. We are ready with outdoor production infrastructure and a detailed safety plan for distance seating and crowd management and are eager to partner to help other groups. But we're stymied by the blanket 50 person capacity on outdoor concerts, which illogically applies regardless of the size of the park space. We urge the city to get the state to adjust this limit and to use a percentage calculation and to modify the current executive order to allow for a stage and amplified sound. New York City Parks has a publicly accessible and well-used application process with staff carefully reviewing requests to prevent conflicts and to ensure that the maximum public space is open to all. We recommend it against anything that complicates their process, but definitely support the open, that open culture looks to fast track the permitting process as timeliness of approval has always been a planning hindrance for us. Our city's parks and public spaces that are, are free and open to all. So we strongly recommend that the majority of permitted performances be made available to the public free of charge as is current practice. Furthermore, as you mentioned, the presenter must be responsible for cleanup of the park after usage. Finally, as an early member of the New York Independent Venue Association, we strongly support Stave Our Stages to help ensure that the music ecosystem can continue to thrive and develop new talent. And we thank the council for its resolution. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Luba. Next, we'll hear from Ann Wilson, followed by Tawaki Tomatsu, followed by Abraham Gross. Ms. Wilson, you may begin as soon as the sergeant's call time. Time starts now. Thank you, Chairs Vallone and Van Framer, committee members and all in attendance here today. My name is Ann Wilson. I'm speaking on behalf of the Randalls Island Park Alliance, where I'm Senior Director of Planning. As nonprofit partner with the city, RIPA develops and maintains Randalls Island Park and also provides and facilitates extensive public programming. Free RIPA events normally include tours, movie nights, and yoga, as well as large weekend events like the Cherry Blossom Festival, the Waterfront Festival, and the Harvest Festival. In addition, REPA works closely with producers to bring major festivals and events to New York City from concerts like Governor's Ball to the Freeze Art Fair. These cultural events are permitted and coordinated through New York City Parks. Importantly, these events bring revenue into the park for maintenance. And during COVID, REPA's operating budget has taken an enormous hit, like those of so many other New York City nonprofits. We're therefore extremely sympathetic to the difficulties faced by the city's cultural institutions without performance spaces. We do feel strongly that permits and events should be submitted through the established New York City Parks process, which provides time-tested guidelines for scheduling, safety, and pricing, among other concerns. Parks also works to ensure that event permitting is done in a careful and equitable manner and preserves spaces for open, open spaces for public use. In addition, while we support facilitating the return of performances by the city's art and cultural institutions, we feel that any use of parkland for revenue generating events should be mutually beneficial. 
Given large budget cuts and reduced resources, parks already struggles to maintain the city's parkland, especially with greater public use than ever. Added use without added resources will add to that struggle. Nonprofit parks partners like RIPA are working to assist the city in caring for public spaces in this difficult time. Revenue from RIPA's cultural programming normally helps to maintain Randall's Island Park. We're looking for creative ways to continue outdoor programming toward our continued viability and support of the park. RIPA welcomes creative support for nonprofit cultural organizations. We hope we can work together toward a return to outdoor performances at Randall's Island Park and elsewhere in New York City. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wilson. Next up is Tawaki Kamatsu, followed by Abraham Gross. As a reminder to anybody else who wishes to testify whose name has not been called, please use the Zoom raise hand function and someone from staff will contact you when you may testify. Mr. Kamatsu, you may begin as soon as the sergeant's call time. Time starts now. Hi, I'm Tawaki Kamatsu. I'm a US Navy veteran. Um, this um, meeting is about essentially having arts and cultural institutions um, flagrantly violate the First Amendment rights of New Yorkers, pedestrians, bicyclists, and what have you, to use public forums without having the, their First Amendment rights infringed upon by cultural and arts institutions. Um, long after I tried to attend um, Jimmy Van Bramer's April 27th town hall in Long Island City that I was illegally kept out of, while I was shoved three times in the chest by a member of the NYPD on the public sidewalk. So the question is, for all of you that are members of the city council, um, exactly where are your priorities? So the point is right by City Hall, you have a sidewalk or a passageway behind City Hall that is currently closed off. So if that's the current case, um, how is it that uh, I guess arts and cultural institutions will be able to operate in public forums such as that passageway behind City Hall, the park adjacent to Gracie Mansion that is also illegally shut off. So yeah, that's essentially the gist of my testimony. Also. Um, to try to wrap it up, um, although I support arts and cultural institutions, I'm firmly against um, having the First Amendment and 14th Amendment rights of New Yorkers violated. So I currently have a federal lawsuit and I'm going to file a motion in, in it over the next three days to essentially um, block your legislation from being enacted. Have a good day. Thank you, Mr. Kamatsu. Uh, we will next hear from Abraham Gross. And as a reminder, if you have not time to testify, please use the Zoom raise hand function and our staff will contact you to testify. Mr. Gross, you may begin as soon as the sergeant's call time. Time starts now. Thank you, Chairs Malone and Ben Bramer. Uh, I'm not going to read from a script, but I'm going to read from my heart. I'm a member of SAG AFRA, and as you might be aware, uh, the entire industry of film and TV production has shut down. Um, sag -Afra is a large union. A lot of people are just simply stuck. This is a radical proposal to help the cultural arts um, that are suffering. Uh, it was, as you are both well aware, it was revealed by ProPublica in 2014 that the essentially the developers of affordable housing have just ripped off the public and they've taken a hundred million dollars a year in tax breaks but never registered apartments as affordable that they were required to and just continued to rent them out at market rate um it, it's heartbreaking to see when powerful real estate developers are able to just get away with that. And if you look at the transcripts of the city council hearings that took place, you just, you wonder, you know, about the public interest. And, you know, there are $2 billion out there that have been embezzled by wealthy real estate developers, which could go easily to help um, theaters and artists and you know why not why not fight for that um chairs and bramer uh and valone why not stand up to these developers and you know i'll just say on a personal note that this isn't an abstract um scam i'm just gonna wrap up here 
this is deeply affected my life. I'm just finishing the point. This has really destroyed my life and the life of my mother who's not well. And um, I, I'm asking a question here to both of you kindly. You know, what happened to me is so horrific that it has shattered my faith in the integrity of our government. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. There's a problem here. The public is being harmed and we just need public officials of integrity to protect us. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Abraham. And I believe you are the last one to testify today. So you bring us to a close with your passionate words. Uh, is there anyone else for our committee council that would wish to speak before we close the hearing? We don't see any additional people on our end, Chair. So I'll turn it back to you for closing remarks. Well, I think Chair Van Bramer and I are about to start the Van Bramer Balloon Balloon Van Bramer podcast because it sounds really good and we are both passionately here trying to kickstart this, these important industries. So we thank everyone for sharing your stories. Um, it must get done now. Just like Jimmy said, the time is now time for excuses and bureaucracy and red tape and permits and legislation and excuses and budget cuts. Can't fly anymore. So these bills and resolutions are all part and parcel of this immediate restart plan to a healthy, safe revision for our arts and culture and all of that makes New York so wonderful. Uh, Chair Van Bramer, it's been an honor to share this, this meeting with you and for your closing remarks. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Council Member Vallone, and I will uh, gladly do uh, the Van Bramer Vallone Show or the Vallone Van Bramer Show anytime with you. Um, we've had some uh, good uh, joint hearings together um, uh, in our current capacities, and it's always a pleasure to work with you. And I want to thank all the uh, staff and the sergeants at arms and the team that are uh, here in these little boxes in front of me, uh, along with Councilmember Vallone and I and uh, Lucy and the entire cultural community and everyone who's fighting uh, for this city and its great people to survive. And in order to do that, we need culture and the arts to thrive. So uh, we have to get all of these pieces of legislation passed and implemented. Uh, and if we do so, we'll be better off for it. So thank you very much. Chair Vallone. Chair, uh, Chairs, before you close out the hearing, uh, it looks like the majority leader has one last comment that she'd like to make. Ori's back. Where are you? There you are, Madam Jury. This is not a duo. It's a trio. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, <laughs> we're in. <laughs> You, 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 need a, you need a beautiful, powerful, dynamic black woman in the midst of this duo to close <laughs> out. But I just want to say I want to thank both of you, Chair Vallone and Chair Van Bramer, for conducting this important hearing. It was incredible and inspiring mm -hmm. hearing all of the testimony. And I thank everyone that stayed on this Zoom um, for this. And it's really inspired me to continue to fight harder um, for the legislation and recognizing that we've got to spark a sense of urgency throughout the city on its response to the cultural community. I think so often that the cultural community is always forced to say, wait, there are more important things than culture and art right now. We're always forced into that space and we have to realize and and the administration and people across this country have to recognize that it can't be an either or. They have right. to happen simultaneously because the and arts now. are too critical to the foundation of everything from our soul to our heart, to our spirit, to the economy, to education, to all of these different elements. We have to be able to do both and we can no longer tell the arts to wait because there are other things more pressing. We are yes. to the success of this city as any other industry. And thank you both. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Thank you for the staff and an amazing run for today. And we will follow up with the media. We hopefully get these votes out as quickly as possible.